This time of year, nothing pairs better with too much food and alcohol than grim, macabre tales of murder and mayhem. This particular ghastly tale takes place on Christmas Day 1929 on a farm outside Germantown, North Carolina. Charlie Lawson's big Christmas surprise for his adoring family of nine began with a trip into town. Sparing no expense, Charlie Lawson agreed to buy each and every member of his family an outfit of their choice before taking them over to a local photographer and having a family portrait taken. Quite a costly affair for a modest tobacco farmer. Just over a week later, it would be Christmas Day 1929. One might get the impression that Charlie was a good father who tried to bring his family the best Christmas possible, even on his meager income. But you'd be wrong. On the day itself, 17-year-old Marie Lawson had been busy in the kitchen preparing a fruitcake for after dinner that evening, while the younger sisters, 12-year-old Carrie and the 7-year-old Maybell, wandered over to their aunt and uncle's house to celebrate the holidays and relieve some of the pressure on Charlie and his wife. Fanny Lawson, Charlie's spouse of 17 years, had been tending to her and Charlie's younger children, while Charlie and his oldest son, 16-year-old Arthur, nicknamed Buck, had planned a very special Christmas Day hunting trip, something of a yearly tradition for the pair. As Charlie and Arthur prepared to set out on their holiday hunting trip, they soon realized that they needed more shotgun shells if they were to have a successful hunt. Charlie sent Arthur up to the store to pick up some more ammo while he waited patiently in the tobacco barn. But when Charlie saw Carrie and Maybell walking down the path on their way back from their aunt and uncle's home, he shouldered his shotgun, aimed in the direction of his two young children, and pulled the trigger. There was simply no telling of the absolute terror and confusion experienced by those poor girls. The instant hit of agony as clusters of buckshot slammed into their bodies. The pure sense of chaos, seeing their own father walk slowly over to their bodies, expecting him to help as any good father should, only to have him smash the butt of his shotgun over and over again into their skulls, cracking them open in the driveway of their own home. Charlie then set off towards the family home, his trusty shotgun firmly in his grip. Fanny, who had been out on the front porch to investigate the gunfire, attempted to flee, but it was no good. There's no outrunning a shotgun blast. Hearing the gunshots from outside, the teenage Marie screamed bloody murder, trapped in a state of abject panic as her father racked the shotgun and gunned her down in the kitchen. The youngest children heard the commotion and, fearing for their lives, attempted to hide. Charlie quickly found them and brutally bludgeoned them to death with the butt of his shotgun. Even the newborn Mary Lou was shown no quarter. Charlie killed her without hesitation leaving a horrific mess in the child's crib. Then, for some unknown reason, he then placed rocks under the heads of his dead wife and children and wandered off into the woods as if in a daze. Concerned neighbors of the Lawsons initially walking over to wish them a Merry Christmas heard the gunshots and hurried to check on them. Instead of the festive merriment they had come to expect, they stumbled onto a grisly tableau of blood buckshot and shattered bone. Before they could set out to find Charlie, they heard a single gunshot in the woods. Charlie had shot himself. By the time Arthur made it back from his trip into town, his entire family had been murdered. Folks at the town's general store had gotten word that something awful had happened and someone in town offered to give Arthur a ride back to the family farm. When he reached his home, the police had already arrived and a crowd began to gather. In the woods, police found footprints indicating that Charlie had been pacing around a tree for some time before taking his own life. Next to his body were letters to both his parents. Some accounts reported that Charlie had placed stones over the eyes of his dead family members, as well as cushioning their heads with them. To this very day, no one is certain what exactly drove Charlie Lawson to slaughter his entire family, with the exception of young Arthur, before taking his own life. Some speculate that Lawson had been abusing Marie and that she may well have been pregnant with an inbred child at the time of her death. Others have insisted that Charlie could not have had the capacity to commit the heinous acts that occurred on the family farm that Christmas day and that the entire thing had been staged to frame Charlie. 
A more credible explanation is that Charlie had developed a medical condition that affected his actions and caused him to experience a psychotic break. Perhaps he'd knocked a screw loose after suffering a head injury while digging a ditch on the farm, or as some reported, he had some kind of painful growth on his chest that had him in constant agony, and he decided to end it all and take his family with him. The killing attracted so much attention that an estimated 5,000 curiosity seekers attended the Lawson family funeral. They were all buried in a single large plot in the private Browder family cemetery just outside of Germantown. The house became a macabre tourist attraction after the murder-suicide and Charlie's brother decided to open the house to the public, charging admission for tours of the property. Still on the counter sat the cake that Marie had been making. Even after the house had been closed, the cake made its rounds in traveling dime museums. Protective plastic had been used to cover the cake after several onlookers swiped some raisins. The cake toured for at least a decade before surviving family members buried the cake, along with the awful memories that came with it. Though the home was later demolished, the area still has enough spooky history to have inspired ghost sightings of the doomed Lawson children and of murderous Charlie Lawson. Unbelievably, the tragedy of the Lawson family didn't end in 1929. In 1945, James Arthur Lawson, the only child to survive the Christmas Day bloodshed, died at the age of 31 in a truck accident in Walnut Cove, North Carolina, quite near Germantown. He was buried in the same cemetery as the rest of his family, leaving behind four children of his own. When news of Arthur's death reached the local community, rumors of a family curse abounded. They insisted that Charlie had reached out to claim his son from beyond the grave. The murders also inspired the famed bluegrass duo the Stanley Brothers to pen a suitably morbid tune recounting the Lawson family's fate. The song includes the following lyrics. They say he killed his wife at first, while the little ones did cry. Please, Papa, won't you spare our lives? It is so hard to die. We're going back about ten years for this one but this was without a doubt one of the worst nights in my life, and it's one that all started on New Year's Eve. A few friends of mine all congregated in one of our parents' houses, doing some pre-drinking before we were due to head out to a New Year's party. We got toasty on a few tins, then ended up getting a taxi into the city center, where there was this massive student house in the Georgian Quarter where a load of locals and students alike had gathered to get bladdered and see in the new year. It was a decent enough party at first, like everyone seemed nice and friendly and whoever lived there had to put in a great deal of effort to make people feel welcome, putting out snacks, ice for drinks, rigging up a big old speaker system to pump out the tunes, that sort of thing. Then at one point during the night I noticed a few lads wandering around the party who looked like they didn't exactly belong there. It wasn't because of how they looked or dressed, like there was a big mix of people there from all different backgrounds and it definitely made for a better atmosphere. The thing that got me was that, while everyone was engaged in conversation or the like, drinking or dancing or whatever, these lads seemed to be just looking around, like they were just lost or looking for someone. I never really thought much of it at the time though, like there were so many different people going in and out of the house all the time. I'd never been there before hardly knew any of the people who actually lived in the house, so I wasn't really to know who should and shouldn't have been there, and it's not like I was about to start playing bouncer or security guard or whatever. Then, like an hour or so later, I'm in the kitchen trying to fish one of my cans of cider out of an already overstocked fridge, when someone walks up to me with this anxious look on their face. Hi, do you know that guy in the waterproof jacket that's been walking around? It was one of the students who actually lived in the house. Uh, me? No, I, I thought you knew them. I reply, taking out a can and cracking it open. No, I thought they were with you. They reply, looking a bit more nervous as they're talking. There's a sort of awkward pause in the conversation before the person asks, Can you get them to leave? This was exactly the sort of thing I was trying to avoid. Like I said... I wasn't up for playing bouncer and I was pretty bloody confused as to why they were asking me to do so. 
Uh, mate, it's not my house. It's not my party. I'm not going to go around telling people that they can't be here. I say before wading through the crowds to find my mates. A little while later, I realized I couldn't see any of the dodgy-looking guys hanging around the party, so I just thought it had been dealt with by someone else. But then, the fellow who'd asked me to kick them out comes up to me and actually thanks me for getting rid of them. Again, there's this moment of confusion where I'm like, I didn't do anything, mate. They must have just left on their own. I really thought that that was the end of it, but boy was I wrong. I remember being pretty drunk by the time I nipped upstairs to use the third floor toilet, one that had some windows looking into the street out the front of the building. So I'm standing there, draining the main vein, just sort of blankly staring out the window when I see this car pull up. Nothing out of the ordinary, just a car with a few lads piling out. I watch them go around to the boot, open it up, then start to pull out mass. I did a kind of double take like, what is this? They were pulling out ski masks, balaclavas, all sorts of stuff like that, followed by baseball bats, hockey sticks, knives, all kinds of blunt and sharp weapons. My brain was just slowed by the alcohol, I think, and I remember thinking, someone's in for a rough night, only realizing it was us that was in trouble when they started heading up the pathway towards the house, the same party house which had an open, unlocked door to allow pretty much anyone and everyone to just wander in and out at their leisure. The night was about to go very, very wrong for us. I don't think I even finished up my pee properly, at least I have no memory of doing so. The only thing I remember is rushing back to the room where my mates were chilling, just in time to hear a load of screaming and shouting coming from the ground floor. I just remember saying, we need to get out of here, now. But my mates were so blitzed that they just sort of looked back at me in confusion like, why, what's up? Not even bothering to move at first. I grabbed my jacket from off the floor, trying to tell them what I'd just seen, and what I'd just heard coming from downstairs, but I think I was so scared and drunk that it all just came out as a babble at first. I think maybe they just thought I was pulling their leg at first, that I was just playing some daft prank on them. I get it. The mood went from zero to a hundred really bloody fast, and I can totally understand their confusion. But then all of a sudden this lad appears in the doorway of the room we were occupying wearing a gator over the bottom half of his face with a baseball bat in his hand. Only then did they really realize how serious I'd been. The lad just instantly took a swing at my mate who was closest to the door and he only barely got out of the way in time. The lad then just starts shouting at us to stay seated but to throw our phones into the middle of the room. There's a moment of hesitation and the lad decides to let us know how serious he is by smashing a stereo near to him. I mean, he swung so hard with the baseball bat that he just obliterated that thing with one swing. That was all it took to get us to comply, and we all tossed our phones into a rough pile in the middle of the room. We thought he'd just grab them and leg it, but that wasn't enough for him. He starts asking for wallets, mp3 players, anything of any value basically for us to empty our pockets. While this is going on, I can see all kinds of chaos unfolding in the hallway outside the room we're in. Lads are getting brave with the invaders only to get smacked in the face with brass knuckles or hockey sticks. Girls are getting pulled by their hair down the hall, falling over their high heels and getting carpet burned from getting dragged along the carpet. God knows what happened to them after they got their phones or wallets stolen. A few of us tossed our empty wallets next to our phones, but since only a few of us did, this masked guy thinks the rest of us are holding out on him. He doesn't smash an appliance this time though. He edges forward and swings the bat down onto my mate's shoulders. Jesus Christ, the scream that came out of him after the impact was just unreal. Like I knew in an instant that he'd broken something and he just falls down to the carpet and starts grimacing in agony. The fellas all like, I told you, wallets now. Maybe one or two more wallets get tossed into the pile, but there are still lads sat around who basically haven't thrown anything in the middle of the room, and the fellow with the baseball bat has noticed this. He takes another swing at the lad whose shoulder he just smashed, bringing the bat down hard onto his side with this horrible, sickening thumping sound. It totally knocks the wind out of him, and if I didn't know any better, 
I'd have thought the gasping noises he were making were him properly dying. One of the guys blurts out that he's got nothing on him, that all his stuff is in the living room downstairs. I think he was one of the guys who actually lived in the house. This answer didn't satisfy the masked fella who then smacks the downed broken bones guy for a third or fourth time and gets him absolutely screaming in agony as yet another bone breaks. We're all pretty much begging him to stop at this point, but he just keeps smashing that baseball bat down onto our mate, barking at us to give him everything we've got or he'll just kill our mate. I think the only thing that saved his life was the appearance of another masked lad in the doorway who told him that they had to leave before the police showed up. And at that, the raiders were gone as quickly as they'd come. They'd ransacked the entire house, beaten up anyone who so much as put up an ounce of resistance. The whole place was just in shock. Girls were crying or wailing over the unconscious bodies of those lads they'd knocked out with bats or brass knuckles. It was honestly like walking through a war zone as I shakily plodded down the stairs, surveying the scene while my mates tried to tend to the guy who'd had the absolute life beaten out of him. Because they'd taken most people's phones, I think only a handful of people left at the party were able to actually get in touch with emergency services. I remember a few of them sort of going from room to room, trying to give the 999 operators a kind of damage report, telling them exactly how many injured people there were. There were police cars everywhere within the hour, and I think maybe about four ambulances turned up to treat the wounded, with another few ferrying the more seriously wounded of us off to the hospital for treatment, which obviously included our mate who'd had his bones broken by the lad with the baseball bat. Once he'd been taken away, there was no reason for us to be there anymore, so we just grabbed a load of ale from the fridge in the house and got walking home. I won't lie. We did take a few cans and bottles that didn't belong to us, but I think we just wanted to drink to forget at that stage. Like it was probably the single most terrifying, traumatizing thing I'd ever seen in my life up until that point. Like I know it's a massive cliche, but I heard our mates screams for months afterwards. Sometimes when there were quieter moments in college or at night, I'd just hear them in my mind. Like not actually hear them, just remember them so vividly that it was like I could hear them, if that makes any sense. Those screams are a sound along with the sound of bones breaking that I sincerely hope I never have to hear, ever, again. In late 2008, I came one night to find my mom sitting in the kitchen all alone and in floods of tears. When I asked her what was wrong, her answer made my jaw drop. My dad had left her. There was absolutely no indication that anything was wrong with their marriage or that he was remotely unhappy. But that afternoon, while I was out, he had apparently packed a few things into a suitcase, told her he was leaving, and just disappeared. I only mention this because it explains why my mom and little sister just didn't want to be in the house over Christmas and New Year. That kind of family-oriented time of year would have just been way too hard on them, so they basically buggered off to Mexico for a month to just decompress or whatever. Point being, I was all alone for Christmas and New Year's. Christmas Day sucked, and I realized that they were seriously right about not wanting to be alone in the house at that time of year. So for New Year's Eve, I decided to throw a little get-together for me and a load of my mates, hoping that a little party might take away some of the sadness I felt as a result of my dad leaving us. So on the night itself, it ends up being about 20 to 30 of us getting together in my parents' place, getting drunk, listening to music, playing Xbox, just a big hangout among some of the people I was closest to. It was a really good night to start off with, and it really did help take my mind off of things for a little while. We did the whole New Year's countdown thing, set off a few fireworks, generally having a brilliant little night together. But the drunker we all got, the messier things became, until it was just a medley of people throwing up, hooking up in the spare bedroom, or arguing amongst themselves. Two of the people who ended up fighting were my mate Chris and his girlfriend at the time, a girl named Katie. And when I could gather, Katie thought Chris had been flirting with a mutual friend of ours and had taken issue with it. Chris was insisting that they were just being friendly and it was nothing to worry about, but 
Katie was adamant that something was going on, that he was cheating on her, blah blah blah. You know how it is, teenage drama. Now I know Chris really did love her, so it wasn't like a stand-up argument, it was more like him begging her to see reason and to not go mad and dump him over some perceived bit of flirting. He swore he'd never do anything like that, that she was the only girl for him, how much he loved her, all this romantic theatrical stuff that you might expect from two young lovers. It wasn't really anything in my business though, so me and the other party guests just sort of left them to it while we got on with trying to have fun. Then a little while later, I find Chris sitting in the back garden, swigging off a bottle of raw vodka on his own. I go up to him to ask him if he's okay, only to find that he's crying, rotten drunk, saying that Katie had dumped him and gone home. I tried to be a good friend and console him as best I could, saying that she probably was just drunk and over-emotional, how there was a good chance that they'd just get back together over the next couple of days when she'd realize she'd made a mistake, but he was insistent. She was gone for good and they wouldn't be getting back together. All I could do was get him on his feet and hug it out with him. The poor guy really was in one heck of a state and I managed to convince him to hand over the vodka, drink some water and then get some sleep in my bed so he could maybe sober up a wee bit before heading on home. He agrees, I tuck him in and then leave him to get some rest. About an hour or so later, the party is winding down and the remainder of us are just chilling in the TV room when someone goes off to use the toilet. They return like seconds later, saying someone's in the bathroom throwing up, then asking if they can go and take a pee in the back garden. Of course, I tell them no. I didn't want them peeing all over my mum's flower beds and that I'll nip upstairs to see if I can get whoever is out of the bathroom. So I get the toilet upstairs and... I can hear someone gagging and retching on the other side of the locked door. My friend Julia joins me, a wee bit concerned, and starts trying to help me talk to the person who's locked themselves in the bathroom. It's some time then that I notice that two doors are open, the first being my bedroom, the second being a little cupboard on the first floor landing. I check my bedroom and see that the bed is empty, so it's obviously Chris that's in the bathroom, puking his guts up because of all the vodka he drank. I shut the door to the bedroom, then go to close the door on the other room which happened to be a little cover that my mom kept cleaning supplies in. My first thought was that Chris had opened up that door thinking it was the bathroom in his drunken haze, then legged it to the right bathroom in his desperation to puke. But I noticed something that, at first, I didn't really understand the significance of. The cleaning supplies that my mom usually kept all neat in a little plastic box were spilled all over the floor. Not like open fluids spilling out, they were just all out of the box like someone had been rooting through them. As I'm wondering why someone would do something like that, Julia calls out that the person who'd locked themselves in the bathroom, presumably Chris, had gone quiet all of a sudden and that they weren't responding. That's when I put two and two together. Violent vomiting, cleaning supplies missing, deep drunken depression. Chris was trying to end his own life. I absolutely pegged it to the bathroom door and started trying to kick the door off the hinges. Julia screams in shock at what I'm doing and people from the living room start piling out towards the bottom of the stairs in utter confusion. I've been really protective of the house all night, not wanting people smoking inside, not wanting people peeing anywhere they shouldn't, trying to stop spillages and all of that kind of stuff. Then there I was, booting down my own bathroom door. It was way too heavy to actually kick off the hinges, but I did manage to kick a hole in the wood paneling, and that's when I got a look inside. Chris was laying there, a bottle of bleach next to him, and there was like pink puke all over the cistern, the floors, and his clothes. It was pink because he drank the bleach and it had corroded or burned the inside of him so much that he had vomited up blood. We were distraught, terrified, almost sure that he was dead but we were quick to call an ambulance. Chris had his stomach pumped and he survived, but it took a long time for him to be back to normal. Because he puked, the fumes had damaged his lungs or something. I'm not a doctor, so don't have a go if I get the details wrong. So he had trouble eating, drinking, and breathing for at least a month after that. Twelve years later, and I've never forgotten that.
and I'm pretty sure neither has he. Because as far as I know, Chris never drank vodka again, because of the smell of it makes me think of that night. God knows what horrible memories it brings back to him. So this happened to me over 10 years ago when I was a sophomore in high school. First let me start the story by saying that at this point the house next door to me had been vacant for almost a year. The elderly woman had passed away and whoever now owned the house must have never got around to doing the necessary repairs to fix it. The old lady who used to live next door to me was a mean and miserable person. She always called the police on the neighbors even though they would barely make any noise or do anything wrong at all. But it was always clear that she did love Christmas. She would hire people to hang up all of the holiday decorations on her front lawn and porch. Well, shortly after Christmas in my freshman year, she had passed away due to falling or an accident of that nature. Her kids from out of state came and cleaned out the entire house and left it vacant. As previously mentioned, they didn't sell it, repair it, or inhabit it. They just left the house to sit there and essentially rot. After they cleaned out the house, they left the curtains on the side of the house open, and if you looked out my bedroom window, you could see right into the house. It was semi-creepy knowing that the house was just so desolate and empty. Well, fast forward now to Christmas Eve of my sophomore year of high school. My brother and I took place in our yearly tradition of watching wrestling DVDs until we got tired. We both decided to go to bed shortly after 2 a.m. on Christmas morning. I shut off all my lights and got into bed and noticed a faint light coming through my blinds. So I got up and walked over to my window, and I couldn't believe my eyes. There was a ceiling light on in the house next door, and I couldn't explain it. I figured that there was no electricity at all considering the house was vacant and nobody lived there for some time. I stared into the other house in confusion, and then the light shut off. Within five seconds or so, the light turned back on again, and that's when I saw it. A brief glimpse of a figure in the doorway of the house. It looked just like the old woman. At this point, I knew my mind was playing tricks on me. The lights went off for a second, and I stood there and stared into the darkness for several minutes trying to see anything, but it was just pitch blackness. Then a burst of light, and there she was again. The old woman was standing right in the window, staring back at me. I fell over in fear and ran into my brother's room. I tried to wake him, but he was out cold. I slept on the floor in his room and stayed up all night trying to compute what I had just seen. For years, I told my friends this story and nobody ever believed me. Whenever friends would stay over, we would always look into the window and try and see something, but we never did. That was over ten years ago, and that house has since been sold. But since it's been sold, the owners have sold it three times after moving in. So I wonder if I'm not the only one who has seen the lady wandering the halls. One thing is for sure, that is a Christmas present I will never forget. Christmas is a time of year to be happy, merry, and joyful. At least for most people. I love spreading cheer to family and friends on Christmas. My joyful mood usually translates to my co-workers as well. I work in customer service, which many people know can be a nightmare at Christmas time, so it helps to try and stay upbeat. Well, on this specific Christmas Eve, customers were doing some final Christmas shopping before Christmas Day. Right at the end of my shift, I cashed out a pretty normal looking guy. I would say the average height range of like 5'7 and maybe 150 pounds. He had parted black hair, glasses, and was probably in his mid-forties. He was buying some fairly normal stuff and not really anything Christmas related. The whole interaction was mostly friendly until the very end when I said something I now wish I didn't say. I ended our transaction by saying in my bubbly voice, Thank you, sir, and have a happy holiday. He stopped and turned back to me and said, What did you just say? I responded nervously and semi-confused. Have a happy holiday? He stormed back to my register and screamed at the top of his lungs, It's Merry Christmas! I backed away in a slight panic and just said, Okay, sir, I'm sorry. 
He walked away mumbling to himself, but I could tell he was furious by his recent actions. For a couple of minutes, I kept staring outside, and I could see him pacing in front of the store, still seemingly mumbling to himself. A few people actually came into the store and said that there was someone outside talking about Christmas and Jesus' birthday. I began to panic, thinking this guy was going to come into the store again or wait until I got out and try to follow me home or something. Well, luckily for me, my boyfriend worked at the same store and he was driving us to my mom's house for a Christmas Eve party at the end of the night. We left shortly after six and at first I was relieved when I didn't see the man outside. We were almost to my boyfriend's car when we saw the man running after us from the side of the store. My boyfriend opened up the back seat door so I could hop in and he stood there in front of the car. My boyfriend said in a stern voice, Hey, is there a problem man? The man still in a rage said, That lady has no respect for Jesus or Christmas and she should be punished. My boyfriend, confused, told the man to back away and leave us alone and the crazy man actually tried to jump past my boyfriend to get into the car to punish me or whatever that meant. My boyfriend slammed the guy down to the ground and got in the car and we drove off. Like fools, we decided on the drive not to call 911 because we didn't want to bother them on Christmas Eve, so we thought, and just wanted to forget the event. On December 26th, we did alert our store manager of the situation so we could call the police if the guy ever came back into the store. I still work at the store, and almost a year later, I have never seen that man again. I can say for certainty that I will never say happy holidays again. I love Christmas. It has always been a great day to spend with my family and call me cheesy, but I really just enjoy the spirit of the day. My whole family and I had just finished a beautiful Christmas dinner and most of my family went into the living room to wait for me to exchange presents. Christmas day was when we did presents with the grandparents and cousins. I was in the kitchen washing dishes with my brother Jake and cousin Teresa. While I was washing dishes, I looked out the window and thought I noticed somebody out by my shed. I didn't really let it bother me because I figured it was some kind of shadow from the tree. After a few more minutes of washing, I noticed the figure again, and this time, I was definitely sure that it was a man. I told my brother and cousin to look out the window, but don't make it obvious. They noticed it as well. We all talked quietly among ourselves, trying to figure out what we should do. Our thought was that this man was technically trespassing in my backyard, so we decided to call the police. They told us that they would send somebody out to take a look right away. Trying not to panic and hoping everything stayed how it was until the police showed up was not easy. The kids started to get restless as well as the grandparents were wondering what was the holdup. My parents knew something wasn't right, but they did a really great job of keeping everybody in the living room. After a couple of minutes, we noticed the man starting to approach my house, and he wasn't alone. There were three more men that came out from behind the shed. They started to surround my house. Confused and terrified, we tried to remain calm. What happened next was nothing shy of a Christmas miracle. The flashing lights appeared, and we heard a minor altercation outside of the house. The officers were able to catch one of the men, while the other three fled. While somehow not bringing a lot of attention to my family inside, I spoke with the cop outside and gave my statement. Well, it turns out my cousin Teresa had broken up with her boyfriend several months before Christmas, and the man they detained was, in fact, her ex-boyfriend. Teresa had started seeing somebody new, and this man figured the new boyfriend would be at the house for the Christmas party. Her ex and his friends clearly planned on attacking him, or at least putting a good scare into him, so I thought, until the officer informed us that my cousin's ex was equipped with a knife and brass knuckles in his back pocket. Luckily, nobody got hurt, and I'm not actually sure what kind of trouble he got into for this. The rest of the night went smooth, and we opened presents, but I had an uneasy feeling for the rest of the night that the other men might return and try to finish the plan they started.
Being the father of two small children, Christmas Eve is usually a very early night for my family because the kids wake me up around 6am for Santa's presents. At about 10pm I got into bed with my wife and started to fall asleep. Shortly after this I was jolted awake by our doorbell. I jumped out of bed and ran down the stairs. More angry than anything else that some idiot rang my doorbell on Christmas Eve after 11pm with two small children asleep. Without even thinking, I opened the door and said, What do you want? It was an old man with a dirty black beard. He was wearing a red jacket and red sweatpants. His face was filthy. He said in a slow and haunting voice, Please, let old Chris Kringle come inside and get warm. I slammed the door in his face and said through the door, If you don't leave right now, I'm calling the cops. The man was quiet for a moment, and then knocked on the door slowly. I yelled one more time, trying not to wake my kids. Do you want to be arrested? He then started to bang on my door vigorously and relentlessly. My wife then ran down the stairs, who I might add is a third degree black belt, and asked what was going on. I told her to call the police and then make sure the kids were alright. The man must have heard me on the phone because he stopped knocking. I could hear him muffled through the door say, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. And then he laughed as he walked away. After feeling a slight moment of relief thinking this ordeal was over, I decided to wait at the front door until the police showed up. A cop showed up several minutes later and I explained the situation to him. He stated that he had no other calls or similar reports like this tonight and that's when we heard my wife scream from the kids room. The police officer headed up the stairs first with me right behind him. The man was trying to break into the window where my daughter slept. The cop immediately tased and arrested the man who just kept saying, Don't worry, I'm Santa Claus, over and over again. The situation was never really explained to me. Apparently he was just a homeless man who was wandering around. The cop said that he may have been possibly on something. Either way, I never sleep quite right on Christmas anymore. If you enjoyed these stories animated by the awesome Mort, but you want to hear more, be sure to head over to my channel, Let's Read, to hear the rest of these spooky tales. My wife and I don't live together. She had become abusive over the last few months, mostly towards our daughter. Our daughter is almost 18 months old and is my whole world. I am unemployed at the moment, but my mother had been helping me out a lot. Today at around 4 p.m. I took my daughter to the store. I usually do this around the time she wakes up from her nap. My daughter is a very active child and can't seem to sit still for more than 10 minutes without getting cranky. I usually let her walk with me, holding her hand and patiently walking at her pace. I usually get just a juice for her, but had to get some extra groceries that I was short on. Flour, sugar, and some noodles. I also remembered we were low on milk and grabbed a gallon on our way back. With all that I was carrying, I wasn't able to hold her hand. I made sure to walk behind her, but that only makes her walk slowly. As we made our way to the register, I was continuously urging her to keep walking, which she would do, but only for a second before her attention would be drawn to another rickety box with whatever was on sale, or she would see something colorful on a lower shelf. I was getting a bit frustrated, but I wasn't showing it in my voice. I kept urging her to keep walking, and she kept getting sidetracked. With everything I was carrying, I started to wish I had grabbed a basket. At the front, their customer service desk holds register one, which was thankfully open. I want to take the time to mention that my daughter is very fond of saying hi and waving at everyone. I set everything up to get rung up, but the service attendant was busy with a return at the customer service area, so I had to wait. The entrance to the store is to my right. The only exit is behind the service desk, which leads into the small foyer before leading to the other doors. As people enter, they have to pass the customer service desk. I was being fatherly to my daughter, trying to entertain her with patty cake and the itsy bitsy spider, 
while we waited for the cashier to check us out. My daughter would frequently wave at people passing and say hi in her squeaky toddler voice. Some people would smile and wave back, while others would stop to adore her. At this point, I'm used to people doing that. It makes me happy knowing my daughter isn't a shy, cranky little asshole like some of the kids you see in the stores like this. The lady was ready to check us out, and I told my daughter to hold my hand since I wouldn't be looking her way. I had to pull my wallet out to retrieve my debit card to pay for the groceries and let her hand go for a moment. I kept looking her way to make sure she wasn't wandering off. The lady went to hand me my receipt when all of a sudden she yelled at someone behind me. What are you doing with his daughter? She bellowed as I turned to look at a man who had picked her up and started running towards the entrance doors. I was shocked. The doors didn't open since they were a one-way set of doors, and the cashier quickly picked up the phone yelling that she was calling the police. I was stunned to the point of immobilization, but quickly realized what was going on. I have a pocket knife that I usually carry on me so I can break the seal on my daughter's juice. I quickly ran after the man as someone started to make their way through the entrance doors. He didn't get a chance to run through before I slammed my fist across his temple. I decided not to use the knife in case I might get in trouble. The man stumbled and I grabbed my daughter from his arms. He then proceeded to run out the door empty-handed. The police arrived about five minutes later and asked me what I had seen. I explained that I hadn't seen the man's face since he had shaggy long hair and a beard. He was also wearing a hoodie which wasn't that much of a surprise. They took the statement of several witnesses, including the cashiers, and had already had their other officers searching the area. Someone had said the guy had ran behind the building, but the officers didn't find anyone. The police took us home and then asked more questions like, have you seen him before? Do you know anyone who looks like this man? And then proceeded to ask about the home life. The CPS had been over earlier in the day to discuss my wife's mental health issues and the police had been here earlier as well. The officer asked if we needed any groceries or anything else and I told them no. The officers left, leaving me their cards in case I saw the guy around the area. About 20 minutes later, I got a knock at the door. To my surprise, the officers had returned with the largest box of pampered diapers I had ever seen a large box of wipes, about six large Winko bags of groceries, and a couple of bags of toys. I fell to my knees and cried after they left us. I had spent almost five minutes choking back tears as I thanked them. They had left us with a Christmas card saying I was a strong father to have had so much go on recently and that my daughter was lucky to have such a great father. There was a hundred dollars in the card too wrapped in a note that said to get a drink or two if I needed it. I don't drink, so I will probably get some extra Christmas presents for my mom and daughter. So, to the fucker that tried to kidnap my daughter, I hope the police find you, and I hope we never meet again. So this happened at Christmas a couple of years ago when I was spending the holidays with my parents and little brother along with my cousins, aunts, and uncles. We live in a suburb in Ontario, but we were venturing out into the woods for Christmas, an idea that my parents had had for a while. They always loved the idea of being out in a hunting cabin during Christmas with their families. I'm a 22-year-old female now, but at the time, I just turned 18 and my little brother Tom was 11. We're really close and do everything together. We also had a dog, a German shepherd called Trigger, who came along for the ride too. He's a real softy, but can be really overprotective, especially of my brother Tom. Anyway, we left from our house on Christmas Eve at around 2 p.m. and climbed into our dad's truck, filled with all of our stuff and presents for his extended family. Tom and I were really excited, winding each other up and my parents were having friendly conversation as we moved along the road. We arrived at the village near the cabins we were staying in and caught up with my dad's sister, Billy, along with her husband and three kids. They didn't converse for long, but Billy was a bit unsure of where to go from the village to get to the cabins, so my dad helped her out by writing down the directions. 
We soon got back on our way and arrived at the cabins at around 4 p.m. There were a cluster of them sort of spaced out around the woods. Each family had a cabin to themselves, and there was one where everyone could meet up with a pool table, a swimming pool, and all sorts of activities. It was kind of a place we could all just chill together and enjoy each other's company. Anyway, the weather was already really cold when we arrived, and the snow was already falling around us. So me and my brother unpacked our things into the cabin and settled in for the night. My dad started a fire whilst my mom made our dinner. It was great. The Christmas decorations were already up and we played a few board games as the night got darker. Dad, Tom, and I decided before coming on the trip that we'd go hunting sometime, so we planned to go the next day. I've been a few times with my dad, but this was Tom's first time. He was only there to watch us though as he was too young to shoot. It reached around 10 p.m. and my brother and I were getting a bit tired, so we decided to go to bed. My dad kept his rifles in a bag, which he kept under the bed I was sleeping on. He'd usually keep it in a locked box, but thought there was no point since we were going hunting the next morning. Tom and I were sharing a room at the end of the cabin, facing a flowing river. The view was beautiful. Tom and I fell asleep with our dog, Trigger, laying at the bottom of Tom's bed. Now, this is when things began to get creepy. It was about 3 a.m. when I awoke to Trigger growling. I didn't find this particularly unusual because my dad suffers from insomnia so sometimes when he can't sleep, he sits in our sitting room at home and watches some television. Like I said, Trigger is extremely overprotective and growls at any noise he hears, but that's when I noticed that there was no light coming from under my door. My dad never just sits in the dark. I whispered to Trigger, telling him to be quiet as Tom slept, but his growling soon turned to barking which woke Tom up. He asked me what was going on, but I said Trigger must have heard some deer or something outside. After all, we were in the middle of the woods. Suddenly, our bedroom door swung open and the light switch was turned on. My eyes stung as I tried to focus on whoever it was at the door. It was my dad. Were you two just laughing just now? He asked as he turned to look at Tom, his eyes wide and his face pale. No, I replied as he moved over towards our curtain, pulling it back as he looked into the pitch black wilderness. What are you looking at? Tom asked as our dad closed the curtains again. Nothing. Just go back to sleep. I was kind of creeped out that my dad didn't say anything about what he was doing, but he turned our light off and we tried to fall back asleep again. Of course, I couldn't. I was wide awake for the rest of the night, flinching at pretty much every noise. It was about 4.30 a.m. when I finally drifted off, but it must have been moments later I heard strange crunching noises coming from outside our window. I was sure this wasn't some sort of animal. It sounded like footsteps. I had this overwhelming feeling of fear and I pulled the covers over my face, sweat beginning to cover my forehead. I then heard a faint tapping on our window which lasted for a good few moments. I was so petrified I couldn't move. Trigger was awake by this point as I saw his face turn towards the window, his ears pointed and listening intently. The tapping started again, but louder this time causing Trigger to bare his teeth. What happened next was the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. I know you're in there, little guy. This deep and husky voice whispered as a horrible shiver went down my spine. Why don't you come out here and play with me? Initially, I was filled with rage. I thought that it was bound to be one of my cousins playing a stupid prank on us, so I leaned forward and peeked through a gap in the curtain, ready to give them hell for scaring the shit out of us. But standing there wasn't any of our cousins. It was a creepy old man who was around sixty, his hair matted and his clothes looked dirty and ancient. He was stroking the window with his hands, breathing on it as he spoke. I went into protective mode. I didn't know what else to do, so I grabbed my dad's hunting rifle from under my bed and pulled the curtain back. Get the hell out of here or I'll shoot! 
I felt adrenaline rush through me as the creepy man's eyes widened and the most terrifying smile appeared across his face. Trigger began barking louder than I've ever heard him bark. My parents obviously heard the commotion and came running through to our room, turning the light on. My mom screamed as she saw the old man through the window, Trigger fiercely continuing to bark at the man. My father yelled at the man, telling him that the police were on their way, but the man legged it back into the woods. Tom was petrified, but I was angry more than anything else. How could some sicko do this? I was just extremely glad I had the rifle. The cops caught the guy just a few minutes later and arrested him. I found out a couple of days later that the creepy man was homeless and living in the woods and he was suffering from a lot of mental issues. It scares me to death to think about what could have happened to my brother if I hadn't been there. We spent the remainder of Christmas Day at the cabin, but we stayed in our Aunt Billy's cabin overnight. There was no way we were sleeping on our own after what had happened. We went home first thing on Boxing Day and never looked back. My dad only told me the other day that he knew someone was hanging around our cabin, so he intentionally left the rifle under my bed in case I had to use it in self-defense. He did that because he didn't want to scare any of us. He called the cops after he heard the guy laughing outside of his bedroom window, singing nursery rhymes. All I wanted was to use my coupon for free underwear from Victoria's Secret. The story starts out with a girl's day and afternoon, 24-year-old's female with my good friend, Scarlett, back in December 2015. We both received coupons in the mail and it was finally time to use them, so we decided to get lunch and then head to the mall. Upon entering Victoria's Secret, I noticed a tall, heavy-set man pacing slowly in front of the doors. I figured this was probably just another guy, too embarrassed to shop with his girlfriend, sister, friend, mother, what have you, inside a store decorated with lace bras and half-naked models in underwear. After we each picked out a pair, we decided to just walk around the mall and go to the different shops, mostly window shopping. Scarlett wanted to find a pair of earrings that were Christmas festive, so we headed to Claire's. For anyone who hasn't seen a Claire's in the mall, they're usually tiny and the entire store can be viewed from the outside given how large the windows are. We were looking at one of the first rotating racks when I noticed a man standing slightly behind me. A quick glance over my shoulder revealed that it was the same gentleman who was pacing back and forth in front of the Victoria's Secret. He was not looking directly at me, so, again giving him the benefit of the doubt, figured that he likely followed his person to Claire's. However, I don't like tight spaces, so I casually move about a foot away from him. He shuffled closer. I scoot away again, and he again inched closer. Okay, weird. I look up. He towers over me, a good six foot two if not taller, wearing a hoodie that hangs loosely, covering most of his thighs and baggy jeans. I give a short nod and smile. Big mistake. We lock eyes. In my head I can hear my friend saying, Being nice causes accidents, and silently curse her. I move again and bend down to look at the other jewelry. He shuffles towards me again, and this time nearly on top of me. He then puts his hands under his hoodie and starts making only what I can describe as a fapping noise with his hand. I'm not sure what he was doing. Maybe he had an itch, but the motion certainly did not look like he was scratching his stomach. The whole time he was doing this, he stared at the rack with a weird grin and would occasionally look at me. I freeze, slowly put the jewelry back on the shelf and straightened. Glancing at Scarlet, we make eye contact and nod to each other in mutual agreement, deciding to move across the store. He follows. At this point, I get closer to Scarlet. Hey, is he freaking you out a bit? Yeah. Okay, uh, let's move back to the store, closer to the cameras and employees. So we move back and pretend to inspect the hairbands, 
pointing to which ones we like. The man proceeds to try to follow us back there, but the sales associate, thank God, steps in front of him. Sir, do you know them? No answer. Are they your friends? The man shakes his head. Sir, I think you should leave the store. He immediately turns around and walks out. We thought it was over. Nope. We stay in the back for a bit, nearly forgetting about this strange man. I looked towards the front of the store and stopped in my tracks. The man was standing, staring me down with his nose nearly touching the window. I cannot forget the look he had on his face. It was as if he was watching his prey. I honestly have not seen that kind of menace in someone's eyes before, and it still gives me chills. I turn and face Scarlet. Fuck, Scarlet. He's here. He's still here. She looks behind and her face goes pale. Let's move, she says. Still staying along the back wall, we walk to the right-hand side of the store. He mimics our movements, never taking his eyes off me. He's stalking you, Scarlet says. Thanks. Thanks, needed that, I thought to myself. We look for the sales associate again, and she sees what he's doing. She looks over to me and tells us, Don't leave the store. I'm calling security. I'm relieved and panicked at the same time. I texted my roommate to let him know of our location, what was happening, and to make sure he could get us in case anything escalated. Another five minutes went by and the man walked off, looking back every now and then until he disappeared into the crowd. Then the security officer showed up. He looked frail and he appeared to be an elderly man in his seventies. He asked us what was wrong and we told him. The sales associate confirmed everything, down to what color clothes he was wearing and the sneakers he had on. The security officer shrugged. Well... He's gone now. There's nothing I can really do. Let me know if he comes by again. I was shocked, a little hurt and frustrated. The employee helped keep a lookout for us as we scurried across the mall to the exit. We sped walked to my vehicle, got in, and locked the doors. Thank you employee at Claire's for being awesome and sticking with us, trying to make us feel safe. You went above and beyond your job. When I recounted the story to my boyfriend later that night, we ended up calling the security office at the mall to complain. We were told that it couldn't be helped. The head of the department tried to tell me that the man was mentally challenged and that at the time of our incident, he was unescorted by his family. After a couple of months of thinking about this, I'm not entirely sure of the case. Despite any disability he had, he was aware of what he was doing when you consider the sales associate asking him questions. This was in the middle of the afternoon in a crowded area in a well-lit place with a friend. I was not alone. Do not be lulled into a false sense of security as I was. Stay safe, my friends. It was December some many years ago. I somehow found myself doing shoots for one of those get your picture taken with Santa things. For the most part, I just took the money for the pictures and everyone else did the rest. It wasn't exactly the most exciting thing. Without going into too much detail, I'll just say that when it came to an end, I think I was more excited for that than I was my own high school graduation. There's a lot of reasons. Things like screaming children, the ironic teenagers who had a tendency to mess with the setup, you name it. But I think the biggest thing was the fact that it was just plain humiliating. At least the people were nice. There was this super hot lady who was always nice to me. Not that I had a chance or anything, but it was a big reason why I didn't just walk away. The guy they had who played Santa was a funny dude. He played the role very well and very enthusiastically. The children, or at least the ones who weren't crying, just ate his act right up. In a lot of ways, I kind of admired the man. On breaks, I would usually smoke with him in the back entrance. One time, I asked him what his secret was. He looked me square in the eyes with this intense stare, which, mind you, he was still dressed as Santa, 
so it was somewhere between being hard to take serious and also hard not just to shrug off. Drugs, he said flatly. Then he held the look just long enough to make it extremely awkward. Finally, he burst into laughter. It was hard not to laugh with him. The guy had one heck of a sense of humor. So one day, he pulls a no-call knife show. I get in and everyone is freaking out. Usually nobody cared all that much as we all got to go home, but seeing as it was Christmas in a few days, this was when the profit was at its height. Messing with this was not to be taken lightly. Ten minutes into me showing up and they decided I should take the role. I wasn't that old, however, I was pretty fat at the time. I put up an argument, but in the end, it was do it or get fired. I tried to convince myself that impressing the hot lady I mentioned earlier would make it worthwhile, but when that first kid crawled on my lap and told me that she wanted a PlayStation 2, I realized that nothing could redeem this. About three hours into doing this, I noticed a strange man sitting in the food court. He looked older, like his skin was leathery. He looked like he's been in a few fights, too. He was looking right at me. I'm not talking about a bypassing glance, either, no. This guy was giving me the stink eye. I tried to ignore him, figuring he'd just go away after a while, but the guy just stayed right there. He wouldn't stop staring at me. I wanted to point this guy out to my coworker, thinking that they could call security, but then I started to let the possible repercussions snowball in my head. What if he realized what I did, just walked away to another location where he could attack me in, let's say, the parking lot, or maybe the backseat of my car? By this point, I knew he was here for me. Nobody does what he does unless they're in it for the long run. Break time comes and I make a brisk jog like walk away from his sight. As I do, I see him get up and move to follow me. As soon as I hit the corner, I run for it. Realizing this goon might see me at any second, I run straight into the public bathroom to my left and hide myself in one of the stalls. It's about a minute before the door bursts open and the creepy dude runs into the bathroom, slightly out of breath. I hold my breath terrified that if I didn't, the bells on the Santa suit would give me away. Thing is, it's pretty hard to hide when you're dressed like Father Christmas. You see, you got these red pants and these black boots. They're a dead giveaway, especially when you're hiding in a stall where you can see the feet underneath. The man saw it straight away and kicked the door open. He grabbed me by the collar and shoved me against the wall. I could tell he was in his late 30s, early 40s maybe. He demanded me to give him the money I owed him. Here's the thing, I'd never seen this guy before, not once in my entire life. Why would I owe him money? Did I borrow money from someone recently? No, that couldn't be. I don't know what you're talking about. I tell him. I'm sufficiently freaked out at this point. What did I get myself into? I mean, to an outsider, I'm sure it looks silly. A goon intimidating a Santa in a bathroom. This guy rips my mask right off my face and throws it in the sink. Then he raises his fist to punch me, but before he lets his fist fly, he takes a step back, letting go of me. You're not him. He looks more afraid than I do at this point. He demands that I stay right there as he pulls out a flip phone and calls somebody. He's pretty low-key about what he's saying, and I'm just standing there completely nervous. What was just a minute felt like hours to me as the man paced back and forth in the bathroom as I stand there in my beardless Santa outfit. Finally, the guy flips his phone shut and smiles at me. I see he's got teeth missing. I'll never forget what he said. It was equal parts confusing and relieving. Sorry, bud. Wrong Santa. Merry Christmas. And out he went. I was pretty confused, to say the least. I don't know how I pulled off the rest of that Santa shift, but apparently not all that great. My boss kept reprimanding me for seeming too nervous and not being cheerful enough. Later that night, it all seemed to come together to me. The Santa who banged in, he was the one they were after. In the end, it all made perfect sense. Why he was so animated, why he always seemed in a good mood, the whole works. All things considered, he was very naughty and... I was almost the one who got the call. I don't know if they ever caught up to him in the end, but if they did, I for one hope that his wallet was full. I'd hate to see what they'd do if he had nothing to give.
A few Christmases ago, I was driving my kids back from visiting their grandparents out in the countryside. They moved out to this big old house once my dad sold his business, one of those offers he couldn't refuse type things that meant he could retire like 10 years earlier than expected. The house is amazing, but the only problem is that it's in the middle of nowhere, the kind of place where the nearest village is like 20 minutes drive away. It's also one heck of a drive to and from the place, one that involves traversing some pretty secluded stretches of motorway. So like I said, it's maybe only a week before Christmas. It's the 16th or 17th of December, and my kids are really bloody excited about it. My wee lad is still five years old, a true Santa believer, while my daughter had only just turned nine, so they're starting to cotton on that something isn't quite right about the whole thing, but they still sort of want to believe, if that makes any sense. So when they see a hand-painted Christmas light dripping sign that says something like Santa's Grotto nine miles, they start going ballistic in the back seat, demanding I take them to see Santa. At first, I straight up refuse. It was a long enough drive without pulling into some lay-by to spend the better part of an hour nattering away with some old fella in a red suit, but the pair of them throw an absolute fit to the point where I decided I would get far more peace if I just capitulated and let them spend a few minutes indulging their childish imaginations. Like I said, my eldest was just on the cusp of figuring out that Santa was just mum and dad sneaking out in the middle of the night to take their presents out of the car boot before stashing them under the Christmas tree. And every time I imagined her getting older, getting wiser, figuring things out, becoming a young adult, it had me choking up like nobody's business. So I suppose I just wanted to enjoy the naivete just a wee bit longer. Besides, once she'd figured out the truth, it was only a matter of time before she spilled the beans to my youngest. And that was a day I most definitely wasn't looking forward to. So after a few more signs like Santa's Grotto 3 miles, I finally see the turn off that I needed to take to get to the grotto. It takes me down this long, dark, dirt track that at first I thought might have been the wrong turn off. But lo and behold, after about five minutes or so, I see another one of those janky hand-painted signs for Santa's Grotto. The kids are just about ready to burst at this point, but I make it clear that we're not staying any longer than ten minutes, and they're to be on their best behavior, leaving when I tell them to leave, lest Santa see what bad the little children they are. The threat of coal in their stockings was more than enough to have them promising to be good, Anyway, I expected a quaint little winter wonderland type thing with a few other families milling around, but the place was barely even decorated and looked completely deserted. It was little more than port a cabin with a few caravans parked around it. Like I'm not messing when I say whoever was in charge of this place had put more effort into decorating the road signs than the actual site itself. I had a bad feeling from the get-go, but I knew better than to reverse myself and tell the kids to get back in the car they'd have gone absolutely mental getting so close to meeting Santa only to be told that I'd just up and change my mind. So against my better judgment, I decided to give the place a chance. We walked up to the porta cabin which seems to be the place where the grotto was and knocked on the door. There was no reply at first, so we knocked again and as we did so, one of the doors to the caravan swings open and this heavier set older fellow with a big grey beard sticks his head out and gives me a death stare. I look over at him and in my cheeriest voice I ask, We're here to see Santa. Is he around? I give a quick nod towards the kids as if to say the fellow who I was guessing was the one playing Santa to get himself together so the kids wouldn't throw a fit. He doesn't say a word at first. He just stares at me almost like looking through me like there was nothing behind his eyes at all. He finally says something like, I'll go fetch him, then shuts the door, only to re-emerge a few moments later dressed in what was without a doubt the worst looking Santa suit I've ever seen in my life. Not only was it lacking any kind of white felt, there was no belt or anything. The bloke had pretty much just thrown together a collection of red clothes and then whacked on a cheap Santa hat to round the look off. On top of that, the clothes were absolutely filthy covered in grease stains with a collection of what appeared to be his cigarette burns in the pants. He walked towards the kids and asked them if they were excited to see him. They gave each other this cartoonish look as if to say, Who is this guy? 
and the bloke has to repeat the question in a characteristically festive voice before they even really twig to the fact that this was Santa Claus. They just sort of nod at first, watching in confusion as he takes out the key from the red pants and unlocks the porta cabin before beckoning them inside. The interior was absolutely terrifying. Like I'm a grown woman and even I got the creeps from stepping inside that thing. It was dark and grimy and the use of cheap Christmas lights managed to give the place a kind of festive torture chamber type vibe as opposed to the cozy grotto feeling they were obviously aiming for. The crowning piece of creepiness was the fact that mounted on one wall was what I guessed was an old sheep's skull that had some plastic deer antlers taped or glued to the top of it. It would have been creepy enough in broad daylight, but the fact that it was being partially then fully illuminated by red and green flashing lights gave it a truly hellish aesthetic. Santa sat down on a grubby old couch that stunk of pee and old ale, then smacked his knees as if to invite the kids to go sit on his lap. Neither of them moved. Their lack of reaction prompted Santa to give them something of a scowl before he very curtly asked them what each of them wanted for Christmas. Both of the kids were so nervous by that point that I had to prompt them to reply. The awkward exchange went on for a few more minutes until I turned to the kids and told them we had to leave. As I'm ushering the kids out of the porta cabin and back towards the car, I feel a hand grab the crook of my arm and squeeze. I turn to see Santa's face pushed right into mine, his breath reeking of ciggies and hard booze. Fifty quid, he hissed. Sorry, Santa, I haven't got anything on me, I said, trying to be as polite as possible, maintaining a passive-aggressive tone. But I promised me and my husband will leave out some extra brandy and mince pies for you on Christmas night, just to make up for it. I don't even know I was keeping up the pretense by that point. I'm pretty sure the whole experience had scarred my wee lad for life and had pretty much destroyed any remaining festive belief in my daughter. Santa growled back at me, calling me an expletive. I just keep pushing my kids back towards the car, turning back briefly to see that Santa is no longer alone. He was never alone. A gang of other people have filed out of the caravans and are following us back towards where I'd parked the car, then starts off the chorus of, Where do you think you're going, love? You haven't paid. He told you fifty quid, get your purse out, or we'll get it out for you. My kids were on the verge of tears at that point, and if I'm being honest, I wasn't far off either. I gave in, took out my purse, and started sifting through it to see if I had fifty in notes on me. Right as I'm doing that, this kid, this actual bloody child, just snatches the whole thing out of my hand and runs back towards the caravan with it, only to be goaded on by the gang of skanky-looking grown-ups going, Good lad, that'll teach her. She needs to learn some generosity. It is Christmas, after all. I didn't do a bloody thing. Well, aside from getting in the car and driving off. The damage control from that bit of horribleness was a lot of work. I'm pretty sure it was the singular event that broke my eldest kid's belief, and we had to reassure my youngest over and over that he was just a bad man pretending to be Santa, and that the real Santa would most definitely be putting him on the naughty list for what he'd done. But honestly, I think it's me that belongs on the naughty list for putting my kids in that position in the first place, and for putting myself on the most terrifying Christmas-related event I'd ever gone through. Far, far scarier than my first Christmas with my mother-in-law, if you can believe that. If you enjoyed these stories, animated by the awesome Mort, but you want to hear more, be sure to head over to my channel, Let's Read, to hear the rest of these spooky tales. Now, this happened back in June 2020. For some context, I'm a guy. I live in a small town in the south. I was staying at my aunt's house for the weekend. On that Saturday, my female cousin had asked me if I wanted to go to Walmart with her. I said okay, and we went. We had to get some groceries and other items as well. After about 15 minutes of shopping, my cousin then said, I think someone's following us. 
I turned around and saw a man who looked like he was in his early 30s. I saw that he also had his phone out as well. At the time, I didn't know if he was taking her picture or just online. The phone was pointed slightly at my cousin. I swear, I kept hearing a clicking noise that a camera makes coming from behind us. I turned around and I saw the guy from earlier. I asked him why he was taking pictures of my cousin, but he just ignored me. I then asked my cousin when we would be leaving. Uh, we only have a few more items left on the list, she said. We got the last few items and then went to the self-checkout. When my cousin put her card in the machine, I randomly looked to my right and I saw the guy who was taking my cousin's picture just standing there. We then paid for the food and quickly left. Well, about five minutes later, I then see a gray minivan following us. I decided to look a little closer and I saw the man from the Walmart in the driver's seat. I told my cousin and she then started speeding down random streets. Eventually we lost him. I told my cousin to just go home. Luckily he didn't find us again. It took me like five months to convince my cousin to go back to that Walmart. And we did eventually go back and we didn't see him. My mom worked at Walmart and she was being harassed by an employee. Guy was your typical Billy Badass. The guy actually offered my mom to whoop my brother and I and kick us out when he learned she was widowed and my brothers and I were struggling to find work. This probably would have been a really bad gamble on his end since my older brother and I worked in the woods frequently and did lots of heavy moving for people. He would often make comments that really creeped my mom out. I told her to report his ass to her boss. One night my mom had let me borrow her truck and I dropped her off and went to go pick her up later. We were going to do a range day with my friends and teach a friend of mine's fiance gun safety and also how to shoot. I'm also a licensed concealed carrier. I rarely carry, I mean other than hunting or going to the range. Anyways, I eventually pull up to pick up my mom and I see the dude she was talking about. He was just smoking and looking at us as he stood. My mom then handed me money and told me to grab a few things. I threw on my jacket to cover up my holster and then walked in. I noticed he immediately followed me around, also glaring at me and snarling. It was like as if he was about to fight me or something. Every section he was there, so I decided to move through a few others. I talked to a young female associate, you know just some bullshit to see his reaction. It looked like he was clenching something and staring. The associate felt uncomfortable as she kept looking at him. I moved and he then followed me until I cut off to the checkout. I got my few things and left and as soon as I got back, my mom unlocked the door. Meanwhile, I was really burning up as my jacket of choice was my heavy car heart. So I was unzipping it and my mom looked really worried as I then heard footsteps coming behind me. I turned to see him walking at me. He saw the holster and he stopped. Uh, excuse me, can I help you? I inquired, kind of forgetting that I had my holster on still. He zips over to this rusty truck, gets in, and then waits. My mom is really scared. I see a cigarette lit up and he's waiting. My mom immediately tells me, Go to the passenger side. I sit down and pull my phone out. I'm ready to call the police. My mom then starts driving and he immediately cuts us off and drives off down the road. As we drove by, we had saw his truck on the side of the highway. My mom immediately floored it and had me pump gas for her when we got to the station. I left my gun in the car for her as she locked the doors. Unbeknownst to my mom, I called the night manager and I told him all about the aggressive threatening employee. He was shocked and I made it clear that if I see that employee again or if I'm followed or harassed, I'm going to be suing the store and its management for allowing dangerous behavior in their store by employees. This was his final straw since Walmart managers let sexual harassment slide, but if it's employee and customer harassment, the employee is dropped. I got back in the pickup and my mom drove until we got home. The next morning, I had filed a follow-up complaint on this guy to the staff. They said that he was fired and banned from the property, and they also threatened legal charges as well. 
My mom came back and seemed happier. She informed me that her creep got fired. She still doesn't know that I was behind it, but it's probably better that way. My name is Serenity, and this all happened at night. I was with my friend who we'll call Jenny. We were walking around at a random Walmart in a whole new town that we were visiting. We were giggling and completely joking around, but also paying attention to our surroundings. I'm a very anxious person, and when I turned around, at one point I saw this tall man walking behind us. I didn't think anything about it since we were all shopping, and I just figured he was doing the same. Then maybe about 10 minutes later, as we're getting different snacks, the guy was once again behind us. I was getting really worried, but Jenny wasn't. She told me I was being paranoid for no reason. So I brushed it off and we went back to looking around and laughing. We then went over looking at the arts and crafts section and I turned around to look at Jenny and that same guy was right there again, acting like he was looking at something. Jenny then looked at me and was like, let's go look at the toys real quick and maybe look at the games too. Then on the way, she told me that I needed to go find someone and that she was going to look for someone else as well. I walked over to the electronics and I think she walked over to the area with the bullets and camping stuff. I was talking to a Walmart employee about him and she told me that she would find someone to tell him to leave. I didn't see him again until I was with Jenny again and we were checking out. We walked to our car with a card pusher guy. He was talking to us and making sure we're okay. We got in my car and Jenny locked the doors real quick. She started to cry a little and told me we should have left when I thought he was following us at first. I told her it was fine and that I think we're going to be okay now. So I started to pull out of the spot, check my surroundings, and saw absolutely nobody after that. We didn't realize it at first, but the car parked in front of us was his and he was sitting there staring at us. I started to kind of freak out a little, then pulled out of the spot and booked it out of there. I ran two red lights trying to get away from him, and he did too. I tried to lose the guy at random turns and it didn't really work. I then had Jenny Google Maps the nearest police station since we're at a whole new town, and she put it through my car. Once I found it, I pulled into the parking lot, and the guy kept going straight. I filed a police report and I asked them if they could pull the tapes from the Walmart, but they said it would be a whole process and so I just told them to forget it and got back into my car. Once I got back into my car, we had entered our hotel information into the Google Maps and I started heading there. I pulled into the parking lot and I couldn't believe it. I actually saw the guy's car at our hotel. Jenny told me I was just being paranoid though, saying that he didn't know where we were staying at. I shook it off yet again and I went inside. The guy was actually sitting in the lobby and then looked over at us. I was absolutely terrified when the guy started walking towards us while we were waiting for the elevator. The man tapped me on the shoulder and then said, Excuse me miss, I want to know why you went to the police station. I'm a super nice guy and I just wanted to be friends with you guys. I then looked down at the guy's pants and he had a handgun on one side and a knife on the other. I then remembered that in my purse I had my self defense keychain. I took it out of my purse and I went to grab the really loud keychain thing, but the guy then grabbed it from me. So then I thought to scream, and I did. After I screamed, the security guard from the hotel came over to us. I told him what the guy was doing and how the guy had been stalking me and my friend, and he took the guy away. The cops were eventually called and we ended up finding out that this man had actually been accused of stalking several women in that city. Needless to say, we packed up all our things and then checked out three days early and we ended up just going home. I wish that I would have done things differently, but I was 19 at the time and I was also really scared, as well as trying to stay calm the whole time. Regardless though, I'm just really really glad the guy got caught when he did. Now this happened last night and I'm still freaking out about it. I really wish I had called the cops. I might actually still make a report later today. 
So for reference, I'm a tall 26 year old female and I have two beautiful daughters, three and five years old. We live in New Mexico in a small town about an hour and a half away from the city. With that being said, onto the story. My sister came from out of town to visit, so we all met up at my mom's house to go hang out. Of course, not seeing my sister for a while, naturally led us to hanging out late. We ended up leaving around 9.30 p.m. On the way home, I decided that we should stop at Walmart and grab a few things we need, since we're in town and live so far away from any stores. First though, my daughters and I stopped for gas because I really hate getting gas any later than 7. Because, well, all the weirdos are around, and obviously it was well past 7 at this point. My daughters and I were having a blast in the car, just singing and making fun of each other on our way to the gas station. My girls were super excited to go to the gas station because the one we stopped at is really huge and it has this big aisle full of toys that my girls were already asking to look at. Anyways, as we park, I get out to put my mask on and I notice out of the corner of my eye two guys in a bluish silver Honda staring in my direction. One of them was pointing at me through his windshield, which was intended so I could easily see into his car. His car is parked at the pump directly behind my car, and I'm parked right in front of the gas station's door. I didn't get really nervous right away because I grew up in this town, and I used to hang out with a really bad crowd as a teen. So in return, I know some sketchy people, unfortunately. So I thought maybe they just recognized me. That is, until they got out of the car. That is, until they got out of the car. I turned to look at them, and I know I'd never seen them before. So I just made a note of it and then went back to getting my daughters out of the car. When I got my girls out of the car, I had turned to my left side towards the gas station door and I noticed the more thug looking guy was just standing there with his arm under his shirt to where I pretty much couldn't see his hand. I noticed something reflecting light near his waistband. I knew it didn't look like a gun, but instead looked like a handle to a really large hunting knife. I was immediately put off by this and I felt my body heat up and a wave of anxiety wash over me. Every bad thought just started racing through my head. Like I said before, I used to hang out with a really bad crowd and I've really been through and seen some things that I wish I didn't. But because of that, I'm a paranoid person and tend to be hyper aware of my surroundings. Don't get me wrong though, just because I'm petite doesn't mean I'm not strong. I can certainly pack a punch, trust me. Anyway, I grab my daughter's hands tightly and start ushering them inside. The guy then says, Whoa, let me get that door for you. I smile and just say thank you, confidently not breaking eye contact with him. I don't know why, but I always tend to read people by their body language and eyes instead of the words coming out of their mouth, and this guy's body language felt aggressive. I had that feeling of dread completely wash over me. I got my daughters inside, and to my relief, there was kind of a lot of people inside, so I was able to relax a bit. My daughters went straight to the toys, and I followed, allowing them to look at them for a minute. We then got our snacks paid for gas, and went outside to move my car to the pump. As I parked and started putting the fuel in my car, I opened the back doors and buckled up my daughters. As I'm leaning over, I had looked out my front window and I noticed the guys coming out in a hurry. For some reason, my fight or flight kicked in and I shut the door. I took the pump out of my car and put it back in, even though I still had $3 left, but I didn't care. I walked around my car to get into the driver's seat and as I shut the door, I then glanced over and noticed the driver of the other car turned all the way around staring at me. Right then and there, I knew I was in trouble. My hands started shaking. I buckled up and peeled out of there. I didn't even care if I got pulled over by a cop. In fact, I was kind of hoping I would because that would probably be a good thing. I looked in my rear view mirror when we stopped at a red light and I had then seen the car coming up behind me. The light was red, but there were no cars coming from either side. So I decided to just run the light. And what do you know? The car followed. I'm now internally freaking the fuck out now. My oldest daughter starts picking up on this and asks if I'm okay. What's wrong? 
I tell her nothing and that I'm just really tired and want to go home, so I think we'll just go to the store tomorrow. She then says okay. All I can think about is getting out of town and onto the road that is practically a straight road for half an hour. If I can get on that road, I can lose these guys. Because luckily for me, I have a 2014 Impala that was a cop car. So it has no governor and actually has a performance mode, which I can turn on when I hit the traction control button. I glance back and I see this car is so close to me and I'm scared they're going to hit me. I see something waving out of their window and I realize it's the guy holding his knife and he's trying to get me to pull over. No, fuck that. What, do they think I'm that stupid? The guy starts swerving back and forth trying to scare me and I'm just praying I make it because once I make this last turn onto the straight road, I then lose cell phone service too. I actually remembered a story on Southern Cannibal's channel about a girl being followed and how she tricked the person following her because they didn't know all the roads and the turns on them. I'm hoping I lose them before we get into the actual mountain where there are sharp turns, but if not, I now have a plan. We finally get to the straight part of the road and the car's trying to come up to the side of my car. So I wait till it gets close and I hit the button. My car then picks up speed and really fast. I don't lose them though. They were still following me and we're about 20 minutes out of town. And I know the turns are coming up quick and you have to slow down because there's no way you can take them that fast. Plus, there's usually always elk and deer on the road at this time. I begin to start crying from all the fear and stress because my baby girls are in the back seat. My youngest keeps telling me to slow down and that she's scared. And my oldest keeps asking me what's wrong and what's going on. And I'm just trying to tell them that we're okay, that we just need to get away from the bad car that's behind us. Sure enough, we start rounding the corners. And what do I see? A fucking elk in the road. I know this was a dumb decision, but I didn't see any other choice at this point. The elk was in the other lane walking across away from my lane. So I decided not to slow down and just pray and hope the elk doesn't come towards me. We fly right past it and the elk doesn't move. I keep glancing back and I finally see the car coming and they make it past the elk as well. I scream fuck and just keep going. There's a town coming up and it has one of the sharpest turns that I've ever taken. You have to slow down to 10 miles per hour to take it. I'm now clinging onto the hope that they don't know this area or about this turn. So as I start approaching it, I let go of the gas slowing down to 30 miles per hour without touching my brakes so they don't see me brake and know to slow down for the turn. I made it through the turn, but I could feel my car wanting to go up on two wheels. But I also knew that this wasn't enough speed on this turn to actually even flip my car. I start hauling ass out of there and I can hear screeching tires, so I know it worked. They took it too fast, which gave me enough time to lose them. I come up on the second little town, I turn down a road and turn right onto a dirt road and shut my lights and car off. I manage to find my phone and thank God, I have two bars on it. Enough to call my kid's dad and tell him what's going on. He says he's on his way, and at the same time I'm on the phone, I see the car pass. I tell my kid's dad this so he knows they're headed straight towards him. I'm sitting there trying to calm down my kids, but it's not working because I'm crying and shaking so bad that I can't even keep my hands on the wheel or hold my keys. It felt like hours, but the car never passed back by us. I'm still so nervous and just waiting for my kid's dad to show up. He finally shows up and he tells me to calm down and just follow him closely home, which is still seven miles away. I'm following him, but we never see the car again. We made it home safely, so we put our kids to bed and I explained everything that happened to my kid's dad. He decided to stay the night with us so we felt safe. I haven't gotten any sleep yet because I'm just still so shaken up from the whole thing. I can't stop thinking what would have happened if they caught us or found out where I lived. What would they have done to my daughters and I? How would I have escaped with my kids? I really don't think I'll be leaving the house for a while. I'm glad we're safe and alive. But to those crazy two thugs who followed us, I really wish you would have wrecked and hit that elk. Fuck you. Let's never meet again. I'm just still so shaken up and my brain is foggy from the lack of sleep and adrenaline. Everyone stay safe out there. People are crazy, and you just never know who's going to target you, and for what reason. Pay attention to your surroundings, 
and always trust your gut. If you happen to have children like me, do whatever is necessary to protect them. Hug them as often as you can and always remind them how much you love them. Please, just stay safe out there. So a couple of years ago, I was job searching as it was time for me to finally find a job. One day when I was submitting applications online, I received a phone call from my friend Josh. I told him what I was up to at the time and that's when he asked, why don't you just come to work with me? Josh worked at one of those cheap motels and I was pretty sure he got paid minimum wage, but a job is a job. I asked him what I would need to get the process started. He told me to just go down to the motel and submit an application. He said that they were looking to hire someone anyway, and if I put him down as a reference I would probably get the job pretty easily. So I took his advice and the following day I went down to the motel. It was the first time I had been there in person, and it really was as dingy as my friend had described. But at rates of $50 per day or $250 per week, you can't really expect any form of luxury. I walked into the motel's office, if you could even call it that. It was essentially just one of those motel rooms with the kind of door that is split in half, so only the top will open if you choose. And instead of a room number, it said office on it, with those plastic stick-on letters. Inside the office, there was a middle-aged man sitting at a desk that consisted of a small plastic fold-out table, littered with paperwork. After asking me how he could help me, I told him that I was Josh's friend and was there to fill out an application. The man seemed pretty enthusiastic about this and told me that Josh had mentioned I would be stopping by. After about 30 seconds of searching through paperwork, he finally found an application and handed it to me. After about another 30 seconds, he found me a clipboard. The application was very short and simple. It was one of those generic one-sided forms where only the most basic information was being requested. After about three minutes of writing and checking boxes, I handed the application back over to the man. He seemed to only take a few seconds to glimpse over what I had written and proceeded to ask me if I had any previous experience doing this type of work. I told him that I hadn't. He asked me about my availability and explained how much and how often I would be getting paid. And that was it. Three minutes of filling out an application and about a minute or two of interviewing and he asked me when I could start. I told him I was available to start as soon as he needed me. He definitely seemed happy about this and went on to tell me that he and his wife would be going out of town soon and he would need to get me trained before he left. We agreed that I would start training with him the following morning. I thanked him, we shook hands, and I left. I called Josh on my way home to tell him the good news and that I would be starting the next morning. So the following day comes. I was a bit nervous, but not too bad, having met my boss the day before. He was definitely a bit off, but also pretty laid back and made me feel pretty comfortable overall. I found out my first day that my training was going to be a bit expedited, as the owner was leaving in just three days for his trip. Overall, it wasn't a very complicated business to run, but it was still a lot to learn in such a short amount of time. Checking guests in and out, completing various forms, processing different types of payments, cleaning the rooms a certain way, how to troubleshoot various issues, etc. After the three days of training, I was going to work one shift with my friend Josh, and after that, I would be all on my own. The shift with Josh really helped me with my confidence, as everything went smoothly, and there were very few instances where I needed to ask for his help. The next shift I worked, I was on my own. I had to work overnight, as the motel was a 24-7 operation. Josh assured me that this was the easiest shift, and most night shifts consisted of killing time. There might be the occasional person looking for a room in the middle of the night, or the occasional guest having a request, but for the most part, it remained pretty quiet. Although Josh said he'd be asleep in bed throughout most of my shift, he said he'd keep his phone next to him and that I could call him if I ran into a jam. This all gave me enough assurance and I headed into work that night without any serious worries. 
The first few hours went by without anything eventful happening. I had one phone call from a girl asking if we had any rooms available. I told her we did and she said she'd call back in a little bit. Aside from that, I just continued killing time on my phone. At around 2am, I noticed a car pull into the parking lot. A man got out and began looking around. Once he spotted where the office was, he started heading over. Although he looked a bit disheveled, nothing really stood out about him. He stumbled into the office and kind of just started looking around, as if he were confused about where he was at. Um, hi sir, can I help you with something? I said. He then made eye contact with me at this point and just kind of awkwardly stared at me for several seconds before finally saying, A room. I asked him if he just needed a room for himself for the night, and he replied by simply nodding. I gave him a form to fill out and asked him for his ID and credit card, which he complied to. While I was putting his information into our system, I noticed some unusual movement out of my peripheral vision. I looked up at the man and he appeared to be trying to swat at and get away from some type of invisible fly. I did my best to ignore his weird behavior and pretended I didn't notice. I finished the man's registration, thanked him and gave him his key. He kind of just looked at me for a moment and then walked off. That was pretty weird, I thought. I just kind of shrugged it off and went back to playing around on my phone. A few minutes later, the silence surrounding me was abruptly interrupted. I heard some distant shouting. Although I couldn't make out what the individual was saying, I could tell they were getting closer and closer to where I was at. Before I knew it, the strange man re-emerged into the office. He seemed very agitated and was shouting at me that he couldn't get into his room. He began yelling things like, I can't get into my room, why won't you let me into my room? I was a little intimidated at the man's level of hostility, but calmly and professionally apologized to the man. I assured him it must have been some sort of mistake and that I would give him a different key to get into his room. This seemed to calm him down a bit. He grabbed the key from my hand and stormed out of the office, again being hostile. I was almost certain that I had originally given him the right key, but prayed that I had made a mistake that was now resolved. For the next few minutes I was still on edge, just waiting for the inevitable to happen, and of course it did. Before I knew it, the man was storming back into the office once again yelling at me for not being able to get into his room. Once I saw him coming, I quickly locked myself into the smaller back room. I knew he saw me go in there, but I was scared at this point. He started pounding on the door, demanding I let him in. He began pacing around the office and rambling like some type of lunatic. I couldn't make out much of what he was saying, but I did hear him say, Kill her. Someone has to kill her. I had no idea who or what he was talking about. Being a guy myself, I at least figured he wasn't talking about me. He eventually began pounding on the door yet again. I told him I was on the phone and would be right out. I know at this point I should have called the police, but I don't want to resort to that on my first night working alone. It would also disrupt my boss who was out of town on a trip. Through the door I told the man that I would personally walk him into the room and try to get the door open, and if for some reason I couldn't I would give him a different room. This seemed to calm him down a bit and I finally felt comfortable enough to open the door. I took the key from the man and we started walking towards the room. I was leading the way, so the man was walking behind me. I kept turning around every few seconds as I didn't really trust this guy and I was almost anticipating an attack. Once I got to his door, I noticed he was no longer behind me. He was several doors down at another room. He motioned to the door and asked me if I was going to try to unlock it. It was at that point that I had realized what the problem had been from the beginning. This guy in whatever delusional state he was in had been trying to get into the wrong room the entire time. This explains why both of the keys I gave didn't work in the first place. In the most polite way possible, I informed him that he was at the wrong room. He genuinely seemed confused, but when I opened the door to his room and motioned towards it, he finally figured out what was going on. I walked to the door and handed him the key. He went inside and shut the door. I hurried back to the office and didn't hear from that man again for the rest of the night. 
By the time I came back to work the next night, the man had checked out and I haven't ever seen him again. I worked at that motel for about one year in total. I had a lot of odd experiences over that year, but this one stands out as the most frightening. I was browsing Reddit this afternoon and came across this subreddit for the first time. Even though I'm a big coward when it comes to anything scary, this has to be the perfect place to share a terrifying incident that involved my cousins and myself about 15 years ago. At the time this happened, I was approaching my 16th birthday. My family had a big reunion every year in Southern California. Since I hadn't attended since I was little, my parents thought it would be a fun way to spend my summer break. It would also be a great opportunity to get to know my cousins. There was three of them, and they were all girls around my age. After I thought about it, it sounded fun, so I agreed and flew out the next month to Los Angeles. The reunion was held at the same hotel we were all staying in. When I arrived there, I was met by my cousins, Jennifer, Belinda, and Stormy. It was amazing how much alike we all looked. We all had long blonde hair and blue eyes, not to mention our facial similarities, but it made sense since our dads were brothers. The biggest difference was how tan they were. Since I had been inside all winter in Minnesota, they were much darker than me. My uncle and dad decided to let us stay in one room together. It was a big fancy bridal suite. When we saw the room, we came up with this joke that we were sisters and we were staying in the hotel together for my bachelorette party. I was chosen as the bachelorette because I was the oldest and looked a little different, like an older sister often does. We spent the rest of the day at the pool and talking to guys. Stormy, who was only 14, managed to trick a 25-year-old guy into thinking she was 19 and gave her his number. We were having so much fun, we stayed up until about 4 talking and laughing. In the morning, which was about noon for most of us, we ordered breakfast and then headed for the pool again. Our day turned out to be even more fun than the one before it. This time Stormy got a pair of twins to buy her lunch. That girl was on fire that week. Later that evening we all got dolled up and had dinner at the hotel's restaurant. But this time, the story we'd created had taken on a life of its own. My cousins had been telling guys all day that we were there to party and asking them to buy them drinks. But most of the men were wise enough to know that they were lying. After dinner, we joined this cute pair of older guys that were sitting in the lobby. When they noticed us leaving the restaurant, they had asked us to sit with them, and since we had nothing else to do, we did. Once we had sat down, they began asking us our ages and names. Of course, we lied and said we were in our early 20s, and they actually believed us. I couldn't help but giggle a bit. This was the most fun I'd had in years. Jennifer and I didn't say much. We left that to Belinda and Stormy. At one point, Stormy invited them up to our room, but I had to take her aside and remind her that her dad was staying in the room next to ours and would surely not like it. I didn't want to be a stick in the mud, but I wasn't comfortable with having two strange men who looked to be like 30 or something in our room. At the point it was approaching midnight, I told the two younger girls it was time to go back to our room, and they argued at first, but once Jennifer backed me up, they gave in. We told the guys to meet us at the pool around 11 a.m. and we get lunch together. Then we went back upstairs to our room. We stayed up talking about the two men and what we were planning on doing when we saw them. That lasted until about 2 a.m. when we decided to go to bed. The lights had just been turned off in the room when we all heard the doorknobs start jiggling very fast, like somebody was trying to get in. At first, I thought it was my mind tricking me, but once it started again, I got scared. I asked the other girls if they were also hearing it, and they said yes. Without thinking, Belinda jumped up from her bed and said she would see who it was. I yelled out to her to stop her from opening the door, but it was too late. Jennifer got up and turned on the lights, and I joined her at the end of the hall. When Belinda opened the door, she turned to us and said no one was there, then turned back to the door and stepped out into the hall. That was when we saw a person in a black mask jump out and grab her. As soon as they grabbed her, she began screaming and fighting to get away. By this time, Stormy had joined Jennifer and I. All three of us were also screaming and running for the door to help Belinda. When we made it out into the hall, we saw that the person was attempting to drag her to the elevator. 
Even though she was fighting as hard as she could, she was losing and getting closer to the elevator. Thankfully, my uncle came out of his room to see what was going on and saw Belinda being dragged away. He didn't hesitate to attack the person in the mask. Once he hit them a few times across the head, they dropped her and ran off down the hall. They made it to the stairwell and disappeared. We all ran to her to see if she was okay. She was obviously scared and upset, but thankfully didn't look to be hurt. Once he was sure she was alright, my uncle called hotel security and told them what had just happened and they called the police. The four of us girls just sat there and held each other and cried. We were all so happy that Belinda was safe. Despite the hotel's attempt at catching the person by locking all the doors, the attacker still managed to get away. When the police arrived, we tried our best to describe the attacker, but since they were wearing all black and a mask, we didn't have much to go on. Belinda was pretty sure it was a man, but that was it. Over the rest of the week, we all spoke to the police several times and repeated what we had been doing the past couple of days. When my uncle heard about our little inside joke about being in town for a bachelor party and how we had been lying to the boys about our ages, he was mad to say the least. The police told him that one of those boys was most likely the one that had grabbed Belinda. His theory was that they were trying to kidnap one of us to potentially sell us to a trafficker. Since we looked so much alike, it didn't matter which one of us opened the door. He said girls that looked like us were super popular in the rest of the world and that traffickers would pay top dollar for one of us. We were all so scared we spent the rest of the week in our room and refused to answer the door for anyone without a key. As soon as the police said it was okay for me to go home, I took the first flight back to Minnesota. I was still scared of strangers for a long time and had to go to counseling to get over the worst of it. From what my cousins told me later, they did also and found it hard to trust boys that they had just met. Unfortunately, the police were never able to find Belinda's attacker and punish him for what he had done. It had been a long time since this happened and when we have taken family trips to Disneyland, I've caught myself wondering if one of the men walking around could be the one that tried to kidnap Belinda that night. Then I'd get a shiver down my spine and remember, it could have just as easily been me. I'm employed at a Los Angeles area hotel that was recently the scene of one of the strangest freak accidents I've ever heard of. When I say recently, I may mean as soon as yesterday or as long as five years ago. I'm purposely being vague in order to protect my job and my employer's identity. Don't bother to try to find the place in which this occurred. The few accounts of the incident were reported in a way completely different from the way it happened. I'm just telling the story to make it clear to all of those reading it that life can be snuffed out like a candle, instantly and without warning. With all that out of the way, let's get to the story. When the story took place, I was 27 and had been with the hotel for around three years. I had started as your run-of-the-mill bellboy, but when the opportunity to fill in at the desk came up, I took it. Then a few weeks later, when a permanent job at the desk became available, the managers gave it to me. My managers and myself could tell right off that I was much more suited to desk work. While I had always done my job to the best of my ability, I enjoyed helping people and solving their problems, far more than humping their baggage up and down stairs. Pardon me for tooting my own horn, my only aim is to lay down a small amount of background before I dive headfirst into this crazy tale. My career specifics aside, the hotel itself was always a peaceful and fair working environment. Everyone working there did their level best and on a daily basis to ensure the residents' privacy and safety. Unfortunately, on the day this happened, our usual stellar level of service was found lacking, although through no fault of our own. I guess I've led you on long enough. Let's get to the heart of the matter, shall we? My assistant and I had only just checked in one of the participants an hour earlier. The other gentleman had been in his room since the night before, apparently getting very drunk. The guest next door to him reported later hearing glass breaking at around 5 a.m. When I first heard it, I was at the desk completing the morning regular paperwork. The report of the shot made me jump from my chair. I instantly ran out into the lobby asking every employee I saw if they knew where it came from, 
but no one was sure. Luckily, the lobby was empty of guests since it was still early. Within a few minutes, a call from one of the members of the cleaning staff came through the desk, and I was called back to take it. She had been working in one of the fifth floor linen closets and had heard what sounded like a gunshot coming from the room across the hall from her. My assistant and I ran up to the fifth floor and knocked on the door of the room we suspected of being the source of the shot, but received no answer. I used the door key to enter, still quietly announcing our entrance just in case we were wrong, but sadly, we were not. Even though I knew a gun was involved, I was still unprepared for what I saw. Upon turning the corner of the room, I saw his body. The gentleman had apparently put a pistol in his mouth and pulled the trigger. He was obviously long gone, so I instructed my assistant to call 911 and request they enter through the service entrance in order to not draw attention. You may see this as a crude act, but my job was to think about the hotel's reputation, regardless of my personal feelings. I'm sure the man didn't care. He ended himself in a public place. He had to have known some poor employee would find him. He obviously had no regard for anyone else. Whether you know it or not, people die in hotels on a regular basis, so the police and paramedics were familiar with our practices. When they arrived at the room, they did their job and soon allowed the paramedics to take him away. They gave us the okay to clean the room and within an hour, it looked just as it had before. Like I said, we were very well versed in cleaning up after the deceased, no matter the way in which they pass. I was a little shaken up, but I did my best to stay composed. I was in a position of leadership and I didn't want to let the situation get out of hand. Anyone who felt unable to continue work was allowed to go home and the rest of us had a short meeting in the office so we could air out our concerns. That lasted about an hour and then we all returned to our work. We tried to return to our normal day's routine and until around 11am that morning we had. However, some short time after then I received a call from another girl in housekeeping. She was obviously upset. Through her tearful words, she told me that when she entered her room to clean it on the sixth floor, she found a man that appeared to be dead on the floor. I'm sure you are thinking the same thing. No way. You gotta be kidding me. I could tell she wasn't, so this time I called the cops myself. They didn't have to be asked this time. They entered through the service entrance once again and met me in the room. I guess they were a bit suspicious about the circumstances because the same detectives arrived to investigate the scene. I left them alone to do their jobs once again and went back to work. Now I was starting to be confused rather than shaken up. Not even hotels have two unrelated deaths in the same day. The chances were astronomical that they weren't. All I could do was wait for the detectives to contact me and let me know what was up. An hour or so later, a knock came at my office door. It was one of the detectives. What he told me next is still the craziest story I've ever heard to this day. From what we could tell, the bullet from what occurred this morning on the fifth floor went through the guy's head, through the wall, and diagonally up the floor of this guy's room and hit him in the heart. We were unable to find it this morning, figured it was just stuck in the floor somewhere. He was dead in under a minute. Poor guy never saw it coming. That's probably why he had such a surprised look on his face. Believe it or not, this isn't the first case I've had like this. Sad thing, but it just serves to remind us that life is a precious thing and can be ended in a flash. I'm always sure to tell my wife I love her every day I leave for work, even if we just had a fight. That was it. He said bye and went back to work. My mouth was stuck open. I really thought I'd heard it all growing up in L.A., but I'd been proven wrong. I felt sorry for both of the poor dudes, but the second guy was just minding his own business, not hurting anyone. It turned out that he was in town to attend his mother's funeral. Now his family would have two funerals to attend. The guy who ended up being the cause of this mess was found a week later be a local guy that had just lost all of his savings he had invested in some scheme. The note that the officers found in his body stated that he had done this in the hotel so his children wouldn't possibly find him. I can respect him for that, but he didn't bother to think about us. The lowly hotel staff that would have to see his brains sprayed all over the wall. I realized I sound mean, but 
I still see that guy all the time in my dreams, and it's not cool, believe me. Like I said at the beginning, I posted this story to remind the readers of this sub that we could die at any time, at 6 or 60, from flu or stray bullet. Life has no guarantees or promises. Please remember this. I was recently reminded of something the detective told me. I'm always sure to tell my wife I love her every time I leave for work, even if we just had a fight. Since I first remembered that sentiment, I made sure to do the same with my wife. If there is someone special in your life, perhaps you may want to try it. It truly can't hurt. Expressing your love never can. My friend and I are having a contest to see who had the scariest episode in our lives, and I'm positive that once you see this one, you'll vote me as the winner. You may have already read his, the story about the broken window and the guy in the woods, but I assure you, mine will be much scarier. This took place when I was 15 years old, and although I'm 25 now, I'm still not sure of what to think of it. At that time, I was enjoying my life and it seemed to show in my dreams. Almost every one had a positive theme, at least the ones I remembered. Yes, like any normal person, I had nightmares and still do, but they were either not that bad or I forgot them right away. That was unfortunately about to change and on a family vacation to the hillbilly heaven of Branson, Missouri. Each year, my family tried to pick a new location to vacation in and this year was Branson. We had been there once, when I was around 10 or 11, but since then... It had opened up a lot more attractions, especially musical theaters. We had just driven in from Oklahoma City, so everyone in the car was tired. Thankfully, my parents were meticulous planners, so our hotel rooms were ready for us when we arrived. I guess since my brother and I were approaching the age where we could be trusted, we were given our own room. Then again, maybe they wanted to get busy in peace. It didn't matter to us either way, the room was really nice. It even had its own little living area with a TV and we. We managed to play Call of Duty for around an hour before we decided we should crash. Just like I figured, our folks had us up at the crack of dawn. It never made sense to me why they would do this. I thought the whole point of vacation was to get some rest and relaxation. Instead, they have us up at 8am and we'd have to sit around for another two hours waiting for them. Once they were finally ready to go, my dad would drive us from place to place like his butt was on fire while yelling at Jeff and I the whole time. We couldn't understand why he was so angry and stressed out. That's probably why I don't go anywhere on my holidays off. It always seemed more relaxing just to sit and chill at home. Anyway, we did the usual touristy things that people do in Branson, riding the ducks and stuff like that. We made it back to our hotel room at about 5 to clean up and go out to dinner. I think my dad had some plan for us to go see the Presleys or some hillbilly crap, but we were saved when my brother got sick during dinner, so the remainder of the evening was spent in our room playing the Wii. Jeff started feeling a bit better by bedtime, so we decided to stay up a little longer playing games. I called it about midnight, and it wasn't long before I was asleep. She came at some point, I'm not sure when. I could tell that I had been asleep for quite some time because it was so hard to move. Then again, that could have been part of her power. Not until later did I see the clock, but that would only tell me the time then and not when she made her entrance. I wasn't aware of her presence at first, but I was already able to see most of the room. My brother was sprawled out in his bed with the covers half off of him, basically the way he'd always slept. The air conditioner's low roar was there hanging in the room, but much quieter than I'd remembered. I just laid there for a moment, taking in the peacefulness of the overall environment, until I noticed a figure just on the edge of my vision. I tried to turn my head sideways to get a better look, but it wouldn't move. This made me a little concerned, and I still had no reason to get upset. Most of the room was still within my sight. When I switched my eyes to the foot of the bed, hers locked with mine. At first, all I saw was her eyes, but her head seemed to grow larger and out of the darkness until it was nearly all I could see. I could feel the rest of her, climbing slowly in occasional bursts up my bed. 
This was when I truly began to panic. The battle to move anything was a loss. It was like I had been frozen in a block of ice, but without the cold. Even when I felt her hands touch me, I was unable to shrink away. I so badly wanted to scream, just get one short sound out. The tears ran down my temples. I was sure I was going to die. She continued to crawl up the bed until her face sat a mere few inches from mine. This was the first time I could clearly see how horrible her face was. She resembled your stereotypical old witch with hairy moles on her chin and black crooked teeth. Her breath was the worst mix of rotting flesh and musty air. When she first saw my tears, they seemed to excite her. She began shrieking and laughing, running her filthy claw-like fingers in small circles on my bare chest. My fight to break free from her continued, but it gained me nothing. Her weight on my body was starting to be too much and I began fighting for air. It became obvious to me that her goal was to suffocate me. I knew I couldn't last long without oxygen and I would be dead in a matter of seconds. Just as I took in my last breath, I woke up. My body took over from there, grasping at any air it could get. Basically, I was hyperventilating. Within a minute or so, I was finally getting control of my breathing and was able to realize what was going on. I stayed laying there on my back for a minute, maybe to reassure myself I was still alive and very happy to be so. Slowly sitting up, I looked at my body for any scratches or marks, but none were there. I also looked around the room for any sign of the witch, but the only other person in the room was Jeff, still sprawled out in the same position. That was the first time I began analyzing the whole occurrence. Had I really been asleep, having a bad dream, or was it real and what I saw actually happened? Jeff was in the same sleeping position as in my dream, and I'd been able to see everything in the room while being asleep. If I had... That would make that horrid woman real. There was no way I was going to be able to figure it out that night, if ever. I did know I was way too scared to go back to sleep. The alarm clock on the side table said it was 4.35 a.m. Although I was still very tired, I was too afraid to fall asleep, so I went back to the TV and fired up the video. I guess I did nod off again at one point because my mom's banging on the door woke me up at 7.45, after three plus hours of waiting, I was happy to be back on the road for home. Despite our vacation only lasting the weekend, I got the impression that everyone was happy for it to be over. I know I was, and not just because of the nightmare. Speaking of the nightmare, I found myself scared to go to sleep for at least a week, but once it looked as if though she wasn't coming back, my life went back to normal. Because of my age, I got to avoid family vacations for the rest of my time at home. I made sure to schedule work, especially heavy that time of year, in order to avoid them. Although I say life soon went back to normal, my fear that she could return still haunts the back of my mind. At least once a week I find myself trying to decide if that was truly a nightmare or if that thing was actually in that hotel room with my brother and I. I've done a small bit of research surrounding sleep paralysis and the like, and I know the hag, as many call her, is a common part of this problem. If the horror that I went through that night was just a scary dream, I hope I have outgrown the condition. But if that woman and her group of monsters are truly real, I can only pray they got their required dose of fear that night, and that they never returned to reap another from my newborn son. Here's a story of a scary incident that took place in the early 90s. At that time, I was just out of high school and working my first full-time job. I had no interest in going to college then, so my only option was joining the workforce and becoming an actual adult. My job was a night auditor. If you're not aware of what a night auditor does, the job basically requires you to do everything from check-in guests all the way to setting up wake-up calls and balancing accounts for the night. Despite only being 19 and at the usual level of lazy for a kid my age, I loved my job. Well, I loved it most of the time, but when crazy things happen, like what I'm about to tell you, it was probably the worst job in the world. Possibly the scariest thing I have ever experienced occurred on a quiet Monday night. 
Now before you hear this story, I should tell you more about the hotel I worked in. It will help in the telling of the story later on, so don't worry. The place was set up in a similar way to those run-down hotels you see in movies. You had your usual covered drive-in at the check-in desk that led into a big parking lot with spaces in front of the rooms. Despite the fact that there were three stories, I was told never to check anyone into any of the third story rooms because of strange occurrences in the past, but that's a tale for another time. Although I may make the place sound massive, in truth I could see every room from the desk. My only blind spots sat just around from the windows and I could check those on my walkthroughs. Since I'm on the subject of walkthroughs, I'll place the actual beginning of my tale right here. As I said, this happened on a quiet Monday, which was one of the slowest nights for customers. During the tourist season, we did pretty brisk business all through the week and weekends, but it was the middle of the winter and the hotel had never been smack dab in the middle of the tourist roads. You had to see one of our billboard ads or know where we were at already. So, if I was lucky enough to check anyone in, it was usually one of our regulars. The night this happened, I had just finished one of my walkthroughs, checking that there was ice in the machines, things like that. I had just returned to the desk and sat down in the office located behind it. From what I remember, I was doing paperwork when I happened to look up at the bay of monitors for the security cameras and spotted a guy in black standing just out of view of the windows out front. Being naturally curious, I continued watching him while he stood there looking around for anyone in the area. I guess when he was satisfied that nobody was watching... He pulled a black ski mask from his pocket and put it over his head and face. I didn't see a weapon at the time, but I sure wasn't going to give him time to pull it out. Since I had a good idea what he had planned, I ran as fast as I could to lock the front door so he couldn't do it. I could see him through the windows as we both ran for the doors, but I got to them first and turned the deadbolt just before his hand touched the handle. The mask he was wearing had a hole for the mouth and a sneer of disgust slowly grew on it. Seeing how angry this made him, my stupid smug self mocked him with the biggest grin I could manage. He slowly raised his hand, and that's when I finally saw the gun. The smug grin disappeared from my face and was replaced by a look of abject fear. I couldn't see my face of course, but I could tell from the smile growing on his he knew he was in charge. When his hand reached my eye level, I could literally see down the barrel of the gun. As he pulled back the hammer, the cylinder turned and clicked. Everything seemed to be moving in slow motion. Then, like he was putting an exclamation at the end of a sentence, he put the barrel to the glass. When he put his finger on the trigger, I honestly saw my life flash before me. It hadn't been a long one, and it was about to end. That's about the time I peed myself. I'm not going to lie, it happened. For a second, I considered trying to make a break for it, but when I attempted to move, I was frozen stiff. So, in an act of acceptance, I closed my eyes and waited for the shot, but it never came. I have no idea how long I stood there, but when I finally got the courage to open my eyes, he was gone. I could feel my knees about to buckle, and a queasiness filled my stomach. There was a row of chairs next to me and I managed to sit down before I collapsed. As I sat there, crouched over with my head between my knees fighting the urge to vomit, I tried to figure out why I wasn't dead. Did he take pity on me? Did he not have the guts? Really, I didn't care. I was just happy to be alive and if I ever meet that guy again in different circumstances, I'll thank him for not pulling that trigger. The idea of calling the cops went through my head but... I decided against it. They would most likely be unable to catch the guy and I couldn't identify him. What I was going to do was change my pants and quit this terrible job at this terrible hotel and go to college after all. I finished out the night and quit the next morning. I told my boss about the attempted holdup and the guy with the mask just out of courtesy in case he decided to come back and that was it. I enrolled at a local community college that spring. After my two years there, I moved on to a large Californian university where I eventually earned my MBA and went on to work at various corporations around Southern California and Nevada. I'm finally working for myself as a consultant and employ several others. Despite the overwhelming fear I felt that night, the incident ultimately turned out to be the wake-up call I needed to get my life in the right direction. 
I had spent so long in school I was in no hurry to move on to another. Besides, I would witnessed the success of some of my friends were having without going to college and I would convinced myself it had nothing to offer me. However, I learned that night a lesson I would like to pass on to young people just out of school. If you truly believe college is not for you, don't go, but you owe it to yourself to be very sure. Because if your life turns out to be different than you had hoped, you could end up like either one of those men, staring at each other through those glass doors all those years ago. This all happened 15 years ago. I was about 19 years old when I was offered a job by my cousin to work for her uncle's glass business. They installed giant glass windows into tall buildings and skyscrapers. Not that it's too relevant to the story, but I thought it was worth mentioning. The catch to the job was that I had to temporarily move to Destin, Florida from Tampa. My cousin lived in Russellville, Alabama, and I really wanted to go visit the family there and leave with them together to go back down to Destin. Now, this was my first long distance road trip, and my very first trip away from my immediate family. Back then, I was driving a green Mercury Sable, a car barely capable of getting groceries back home, but in my invincible youth, I didn't really care about that. I was just so pumped to be spreading my wings and getting out into the real world that the risks didn't really concern me. My mom and dad had tried to get me to plan and pack better, knowing the trip could have its pitfalls. But I mean, it wasn't like the trip was going to last days, and also fast food exists, so I wasn't really stressing out about that. I mean, I'm not stupid. I packed for the trip, and I'm going to be staying there for a few months in Destin. But they were really adamant on me bringing food, water, emergency supplies, etc. I declined because it wasn't the 1930s, and of course there's gas stations at every exit, and I had a Razor flip phone. My way of thinking was, what could possibly happen on two busy interstates? It wasn't like I was going to some far off country with no cell service. Anyways, fast forward to the trip. I'm a Florida boy, so I had no idea Alabama could get so cold, and I also had no idea that the heat was broken in my car. I had never really used it. At first I'm thankful because by the time I reach Alabama, I'm tired as hell and I had made a lot more stops than I anticipated. I still had a few hours to go, and the cold air was keeping me wide awake. Finally, I pull off the interstate and I start heading through these smaller numbered roads. The roads didn't really have conventional names like in Florida. They were just numbered, which I kind of found odd. After driving on those a bit, I started being sent down gravel roads. This was the days of MapQuest, so I didn't have a GPS guiding me through the just paved roads or rerouting me around roadblocks. I was starting to get really hungry and I thought back to my parents telling me to pack food. I really should have listened. The sketchiest thing with MapQuest was that you just printed out the directions, so you didn't really have a map to fall back on. So going out of your way to find fast food at an exit came with the potential of legitimately getting lost. So I had basically passed a few times to turn off for food because I was tired and I just didn't want to chance it. Instead, however, I was looking for something off the side of the road that I could easily pull in and then back out with no fuss. But more importantly, no risk of getting lost. My prayers were answered a little down the road when I saw a beat up old country grocery store on my right hand side. It didn't even have a name. It just said grocery right across the front of the white building. I pulled in because the light shining across the grocery sign was on, but found it odd that most of the lights inside were off. I'm not gonna lie, this gave me the creeps a little, but it didn't stop me from going up to the door. I was really starving and maybe this was a 24 hour place, but I wasn't sure. I saw a shadow move across the back of the long aisles as I approached the glass door and surprisingly opened it with ease. At this point, I was honestly half expecting them to be closed due to the lack of lighting inside, and I was really hoping that the owner would take pity on a tired traveler and let me grab some snacks. I then called out, Hello? Anyone here? No one answered. I then said something along the lines of, I saw you when I pulled up and I was hoping you're still open. Again, no answer. Now, this was really naive of me, 
but I assumed that maybe the owner was just older or something and maybe he couldn't hear me, or that maybe he was deaf, so I went further back into the store. It honestly didn't really smell that great inside there, and I had hoped that they had at least had some chips or something. At least those are sealed. Suddenly a man emerged from the back. Oh, I'm so sorry. We were just about to close. How can I help you? He asked with a smile. He clearly made me jump out of my skin at first, but he seemed friendly enough. Not the old man I was picturing before, but actually a much younger guy. Maybe in his 30s. Yeah, I just came up from Florida. It's been a long drive. I was kind of hoping you guys had something to eat for the trip. Oh, we have plenty. What are you looking for exactly? He said without taking his eyes off me. The guy had a really weird unblinking stare that just really put me on edge. But what made me the most uncomfortable was his smile. He smiled big, but his eyes never moved. As in, the only way you could tell he was conveying an emotion was by looking at his mouth. The rest of his face stayed the same. Most people, you could tell they're smiling even if their mouth was covered because you smile with your whole face, but not this guy. Yeah, I just wanted some chips, maybe a Coke. Do you have any Doritos? Of course, he said, walking past me. He locked the door behind me before turning and smiling. I don't want anyone else walking in, he chuckled. Him locking the door was really creepy, but I just shrugged it off because the reasoning was pretty sound, even though it felt off. Follow me. The guy said as he walked towards the back of the store. I was young, but I really should have been smart enough to know that the store owners generally don't give customers a tour of the store, but I had lived a pretty sheltered life. I could feel that something was off, but I didn't want to offend him by asking questions like, what's that smell, and other things. We get to the back of the store to where those plastic flaps hang that separate the customer side and the back end. When the man sticks his hand through, parting through the plastic, then saying, Right this way. Now alarm bells are starting to go off in my head, especially as he starts looking around and past me like someone who's selling drugs and trying to watch out for the police. Uh, back there? I ask and start to back up a little. That's when I then notice chips right beside me on the aisle. The guy noticed me see the chips and then says, Yeah, back here. We got all our good stuff in the back. You can come take your pick. By this time, I had found the source of the buzzing. Flies are flying over the meat section, and the dim light that's reflecting off the packaging lets me know that it's been sitting there a while. I'll just take this if that's alright. I say nervously as I grab a bag off the shelf next to me, and then start backing up towards the door. Trust me, those are no good. I have way better stuff back here. He smiles again gesturing for me to head back. I fake pat my pockets, then saying, Oh man, I think I forgot my wallet in my car. I'll be right back. As soon as the words left my lips, I then spun around and did a light jog to the front, increasing with speed as I approached the door. I make it to the door and twist the lock a couple times until I hear the click. I push the door open and turn back to look at where the man is, but he's gone. I jumped into that car and sped the fuck out of that parking lot and didn't stop again until I reached my cousin's house. This was by far one of the eeriest and creepiest things that have ever happened to me. This happened when I was 7 years old with my twin sister and mother. We had just entered our local grocery store, Surefine. When a man no more than 10 feet in front of us glanced over and immediately whipped his head back towards us. Now as a quick side note, my twin and I at that age were always dressed in matching dresses and we had long blonde hair that had always got us looks of alls and affection, but this was different. He was a bulky middle-aged man of mid-eastern descent and it stopped what he was doing to fully look at us up and down. A really husky smile crossed his scruffy face. My mother paid no mind to this, as she was no stranger to creepy men herself. I immediately grumbled to my twin Cass how creepy it was the way the man was looking at us. So as we turned left to start going through the aisles, Cass and I turned and we saw the man walking toward us with a shopping cart. When we first made eye contact, he immediately turned his attention to a table with baked goods on it, 
which kind of stood out to Cass and I more than if he had just kept walking normally. So my mother's obviously shopping and Cass and I just keep glancing back and we keep catching the man at the end of every aisle that we enter, just staring with no expression on his face and even from a slight distance, he was seemingly breathing like really weirdly. I also noticed that his cart continues to remain empty except for the baked goods that he grabbed when we had first looked back at him. We tell my mother but she just rolls her eyes at us and tells us that he probably thinks we're following him because we keep looking at him. The man disappears as we hit the last of the aisles, and Cass and I are already on a completely different topic by now, when we're heading for the registers, having almost completely forgotten about him within minutes. We're about to make it to the register when my sister asks my mom for a candy bar, and I quickly join to which she then angrily replies that we don't have the money for it. We're both pouting at this point and she threatens to leave us as she begins putting things on the conveyor belt. But then Cass and I watch my mother turn to face us again when her expression completely changes and her eyes shift behind us. It's the man. He's sweating profusely at this point and he's literally less than like a foot behind us. Cass and I immediately take a step forward towards our mother. The man laughs awkwardly then apologizes, saying, Sorry ma'am. I didn't mean to scare you girls. You're all just so beautiful. These girls, are they yours? My mother kind of scoffs to this and then goes, Yeah, they're mine. And he does that same awkward laugh again, then saying, I couldn't help but notice that you don't have the money to get them what they want. How old are they, and you as well? I could help you. I have lots of money. Money's no problem for me. My mother's face then furrows in confusion and annoyance, then snapping. Um, excuse me? Like clockwork, he laughs again like it's some big joke, then says, I'm serious, how much? My mother stares at him blankly for a moment, and he continues. How much for the girls? I'd like both of them, but if you can only part with one, I can still make that work. I'll give you the money. Just name your price, and I can give them anything they want. Any candy they want. He grins yet again and wipes his brow, looking down at us. My mother doesn't respond to him, just looks at us and growls, Here. Now. So we do as we were told, which was fine by us because we didn't want to be anywhere near this creepy man. The cashier was a teenage girl no older than 17 and she was just completely wide-eyed watching this conversation occur as she silently continues to scan our groceries. Once we were next to my mother, she then growls at the man. If you so much as lay one fucking finger on my kids, I'll break it off and shove it down your throat. Which were some pretty big words coming from my 4 foot 11 mother. But the man's face darkens, and without even purchasing anything, he walks around the cash register and exits, but he doesn't get far. The entire front of the store is glass, so moments later, we watch as he presses his face against the glass, trying to see in, leaving a sweaty face print behind. Now, at this point, the cashier is alerting her manager and asking him to call the police. My mother immediately assures them that that's not necessary, and just asks the manager to walk us out to her car. We see no sign of the man as we unload our groceries and hop into the car. My mother quickly drives us home once we sit in the car for a few minutes, scanning for any signs that he might be waiting in a car or something. We eventually made it home safely, and nothing ever came of it. I don't know what happened to the man, but I truly hope he never convinced anyone to give him their kid. That's absolutely horrific to think about. So this happened when I was in elementary school, and it was around 4th or 5th grade. I was really excited for the day because, of course, it was hat day. Which is when you bring a dollar and give it to the teacher and you can wear your hat for the day. So the day went pretty normal. Went to breakfast, had specials, went to class, etc. All that fun stuff. Now the best time of the day came around. Lunch. So I was really excited because we go to recess after lunch. But I was also super hungry. So anyways. I get in line, get my food, pay, and sit down with some of my friends. Probably about 20 minutes or so goes by, and I was done with my food and kind of just sitting there chatting with my friends. Well, another 10 minutes go by, and I'm starting to get a little worried because we're staying a little longer there than usual, so I decide to get up to ask a teacher what's going on. The teacher just said she's sorry, and she doesn't really know herself. 
Another three minutes go by and the principal comes down and tells all the teachers to shut the cafeteria doors. Everyone's kind of freaking out a bit, but not a lot. They're just kind of confused on what's happening. The principal then comes in the cafeteria and then says, Listen everyone, pay attention. We're going on a soft lockdown, so please everyone stay in your seats and do not get up. Nobody is to be let out into the halls. And then she left. Around 20 more minutes go by and everyone is still a little freaked out. Some people are even starting to cry. So I'm basically talking with friends and chatting with people around me trying to keep my mind off of what's happening when the teachers then start to close the blinds on all the windows. The intercom starts up again and then says, Look everyone, we're going on a hard lockdown. Stay where you are. Everyone is totally freaking out now. An hour goes by and now half of the people are crying. I'm being a little dramatic bitch and I basically start writing on a paper about if I don't make it out alive, I love you type things. And so I'm literally having like a mental breakdown while half of the place is crying. I decide to get up and ask the teacher what's going on and what she then told me absolutely sent chills down my spine. There's people who are saying they're going to start a school shooting. They're protesting outside the school and police are outside as well. I literally just froze. I run back over to my seat and then tell all the people around me what's happening and just start hugging everyone, thinking this might be the last time that I'm ever going to see them or my parents again. After what feels like a hundred hours, probably just one more hour in reality, and the intercom comes back on. They're saying that we're now on a soft lockdown again. I'm still crying my eyes out and hugging my friends. Another 40 minutes pass and the lockdown is now finally over. We survived. Everyone is still kind of crying, but they're a bit more happy and stuff. So it takes us about 20 minutes to get out of the cafeteria. We eventually get out, and everyone's moms and dads are there to pick them up. I'm going into the classroom, just trying to think what the hell happened. After about 30 or 40 minutes of waiting while crying, my mom finally shows up. I hugged her the tightest that I've ever hugged anyone in my life, and then went home. I was telling my mom what happened all the way home. I even later heard that they were apparently going to come back on Wednesday and then shoot up the school then. Well, as you can imagine, I didn't go to school that Wednesday. Yet nothing ever happened. I was still absolutely traumatized from this event. If you're the person that almost did this to us, I truly hope that we never meet. I really hope you burn in hell for traumatizing a 10-year-old girl who just wanted to wear a hat that day. You sick, awful fuck. In 2017, in my last semester of high school, some friends and I decided to skip the pep rally for the girls varsity basketball team making the playoffs for the first time. My last period of the day was theater tech. I was really just taking it as a fine arts credit, and two of my friends in the grade below me were in that class with me. We decided to skip the pep rally, leave school early, and go to the nearby Taco Bell like we did every day. However, administrators and security guards patrolled the parking lots to catch kids trying to skip, so we took a detour instead through the nature trail on campus in order to avoid them. Once in the nature trail, we had came across this kid that I hadn't seen before. He was a skinny white kid with shaggy black hair, wearing baggy jeans, and a plain white t-shirt. He was shorter than me, but the most notable thing about him was his general look of dishevelment. His hair was really wild and full of leaves and twigs. His plain white t-shirt was dirty, and the knees of his jeans were stained green and brown. He actually seemed like he had been crawling around in the nature trail. I remember wondering for a split second if maybe he lived there. When we came upon him, we were walking in one direction parallel to the school and to the back of the parking lot, and he was coming directly toward us. I knew the nature trail well enough to know that there was a bend that led deep into the woods, and I figured he had come from there. He was out of breath, and he looked scared. My two friends said hi to him. My friends were in the grade below me, and later told me that the kid was in their grade, and was just acquaintances with my two friends. It was really just supposed to be a quick hello, but I couldn't help but notice how scared he looked, and how suspicious he seemed of us. He asked us what we were doing in the woods, and we told him we were skipping the pep rally. One of my friends then asked, What have you been doing out here? Camping? Me and my other friend kind of gave a nervous laugh, but the kid didn't even crack a smile. 
He explained that he was dropped off at school that morning and he was supposed to get on a bus to take him to DAEP. Now, DAEP was the alternative school that kids who got suspended from school had to go to. Now his plane outfit started to make sense now. It was the infamous uniform of that alternative school. He then explained that he didn't want to go to the alternative school. So when his mom dropped him off, he pretended like he would wait for the bus and then hid in the nature trail for the full eight hours of the school day. He was still acting really skittish and without even looking at each other or speaking to each other. My friends and I could just feel that something definitely wasn't right and that we were in some kind of danger. The kid looked around nervously often as if someone might have followed us or if we were alone in the woods. We hit him with a, all right man, well good luck. We're going to try to get to our cars and go home before the pep rally ends. When he heard the word cars, he perked up. He started slowly walking with us towards the parking lot, continuing to talk. He becomes a lot more friendly now and asks if we can give him a ride home. We give him some half-baked excuse why we couldn't, but he doesn't really take no for an answer. He tells us that people are going to start looking for him pretty soon and that he was going to be in a lot of trouble if he doesn't get out of there. We tell him that he'd probably be fine hiding there deep in the nature trail, but he then just tells us, Nah man, you don't understand. I broke into a car at the fellowship. He pointed in the direction of the mega church that had a parking lot backed up to my school, then saying, I took this. From his waistband, he then pulled out a handgun, and I felt sick to my stomach. I had never seen a real gun like that in real life. At this point, I really felt like I was in danger. Not just because he had produced a gun. I had never really been scared of them. More so that the entire interaction just felt really uneasy. And that the guy was already unsettling and desperate to begin with. One of my friends then very cautiously tells him that he should probably just ditch it and take off somewhere. And he just stood there staring at us for a really uncomfortable amount of time. His eyes meeting each of ours. I broke the silence by saying that we wouldn't tell anyone. But that we really had to go before the pep rally ended. And then my other stupid ass friend who had been virtually silent the entire time then spoke up and said, Yeah, and it's really best we're not around if they start looking for you for that, pointing to the handgun. His eyes narrowed once more and he asked if one of us could take him home. This time, however, it felt more like a command. I've never really been a super brave person, but in that moment, I don't know why, I just blurted out, Nah man, I'm good. And again, there was a really uncomfortable silence. Then he asked, Before you leave, do you guys want to see something? My first friend was kind of a hothead, and although he was really uncomfortable with the situation, he wasn't afraid of conflict, nor was I. My other friend, however, wasn't a fan of conflict, and would almost always de-escalate first. We all looked at each other, and me and my first friend kind of had an unspoken understanding. Like if this was really going to happen, or if we were going to have to run or fight. My other friend was very visibly afraid. He asked, What is it that you want to show us? And before the kid could answer, my first friend then said, We don't want to see it. We have to go. My first friend started briskly walking past the kid, and me and my other friend quickly followed. Within a few steps, we just started sprinting towards the parking lot. I decided to look back once we were about 50 steps away. As I looked back, he was still just standing there, watching us run. He put the gun back in his waistband before taking a small adjacent trail back deeper into the woods. By the time we made it to the parking lot, there were police everywhere. We were sweating out of breath and absolutely terrified from everything that happened. They ended up finding the kid within the next 10 minutes. Somehow in the chaos, nobody saw us exit the nature trail and into the parking lot. But since there were so many cops in the parking lot, we decided to just head back inside through another side door, only to find out that the door was locked. That's when an administrator had found us, brought us inside, and then shoved us into a classroom where we were able to talk with the others and find out what was going on. This is what we could piece together from what we learned. Turns out that the kid had skipped DAEP, hid in the nature trail, broke into a car at the church, and then stole a semi-automatic shotgun and handgun from the car. After stealing the guns, he texted his girlfriend and he told her he was about to do something really terrible and that whenever she saw his name on the news, she should turn off the TV. He told her explicitly that he was going to kill all the kids at school. She knew that he was supposed to be in DAUP and she was so worried about the text that she contacted the police. 
DAEP went on lockdown until officers got a call from a guy at church that had two guns that had been stolen from his car behind the school. And that's when they put two and two together and caught him hiding in the woods. I guess when he saw me and my two friends in the nature trail, he quickly hid the shotgun, but just didn't have enough time to hide the pistol. That or he just didn't care enough to hide. Whatever the case, I'm just really, really glad me and my friends got out alive that day. Who the fuck really knows what could have happened if we actually gave him a ride or stayed behind with them. I'm 15 years old and currently in the 10th grade. Last year I was acting for one of my school's productions as I go to this really artsy school in my city, so the turnout was pretty good. I had played a really small part who basically explains the plot. Anyhow, after I was done with the scene, me and a couple of the other actors had decided to go backstage. Behind our stage was this hallway. Most of the actors would just chill and wait for their scenes there. At the end of the said hallway was a door that would lead outside. I was chatting with a friend of mine when there was a knock at the door. We all froze. One of the seniors named Jay had asked what it was. We all started to stare out of the window of the door into the pitch black. I began to walk towards the door with Jay right behind me, then telling me to let him go out. I didn't really know what to do at that point. I guess I just really wanted to impress the other actors. I opened the door and looked upon the field. A really cool breeze then hit me in the face. There was another actor there named Kai that stood behind me as I looked around the door. I couldn't see anyone though, so I shut the door. All of the other actors were scolding me for opening the door. Anyhow, right after the end of the night after the show had finished, I was waiting in the almost empty staff and student parking lot right outside for my mom to pick me up. I was listening to some music and looking around when I then saw something move right in the field. I turned my head to try and get a closer look of it, and I could have sworn that I saw two people hiding right under a tree. One was holding what had looked like a baseball bat, while the other just stood next to him. Once they had spotted me, I then yelled, Hey, what are you doing over there? They both then turned and then began to run towards me. I began to bang on the doors and was constantly looking right over my shoulder at the two of them. Luckily for me, one of the other actors had quickly opened the door and I then ran inside and told her to shut it. She did, and then she began to ask me what was wrong, and I swear I could feel my stomach drop. Right at that moment, there was a loud bang on the door. We could now see that it was two fully grown men who appeared to be in their 30s. One was hitting the door with a metal baseball bat, and the other was holding what looked to be a steak knife. Luckily, the actress, who I'll refer to as Taylor, began to dial 911 and then yelled that she was calling the cops. They had immediately bolted. When the cops arrived, they had searched under the tree. As it turns out, they had apparently been there since the start of the play, based on the cigarettes and a pamphlet about the play that was found under it. What was shocking was that my name, along with two of my fellow actors, the main characters, were circled. It seemed like when they knocked on the door, they were hoping it was just one of those actors. I guess they thought we'd be an easy target or something. I don't know. I'm really grateful for Jay being behind me when I had opened the door. And please, whatever you do, always have someone nearby. You just don't know what's out there lurking in the darkness, just waiting for you. Be careful. I typically don't really like attention, yet since freshman year I've got nothing but admirers. It wasn't quite the dream though. I tend to attract guys that I find, for lack of a better word, gross and dumb. They have no idea about boundaries or hygiene. The people who I did like seem to never feel the same. This one boy really stands out like a sore thumb because I had once told this story in a YouTube video. However, I was urged to delete it because of some of the information I said. This started when I was around 14 to early 15 years old. For some quick context, I'm autistic and I use a classroom called BMC. The classroom was made for kids who needed help with emotional issues, such as anger or depression. 
Now, I only ever went to this classroom when I needed a break from all of the kids in the hectic classrooms, or whenever I was agitated. I never really talked to anyone in the classroom other than the staff. There were always at least two or three teachers in there to make sure none of these kids went too crazy. Some were really chill, but a lot of them were really crazy and hyper. I, most of the time, just listened to music while working. Because of this, I was shut off from the craziness and kind of just in my own little world. One day though, one of these kids who we'll call Jack came out to my spot on the bus stop. I ride the special need bus because the regular ones are typically just a little too crazy or crowded for me. But the bus that I usually rode parked at the furthest end of the bus loop. So I normally just wait by the trees nearby while listening to music and singing. That's when who we'll call Jack then came up to me. I was kind of surprised. He said that he had a crush on me despite us never even talking prior to this point. That was one warning sign I ignored. The second was that he asked if I wanted to go to prom with him. He was a senior. What made it even worse was that when my bus finally showed, I gave him my number and told him bye. What he said back to me, well, made me want to vomit. He then said with no hesitations whatsoever, I love you. I'm not kidding. The literal minute that I sit down on the bus, he then starts spamming me with texts. At one point I even muted his texts and they'd still blow up my phone. Eventually I told my parents and the BMC manager what he was doing to me. They told me that he was 18 and that what he was doing could be considered illegal. I immediately blocked him on every single platform I owned. I really thought that would be the end of it. But sadly not. He would occasionally try and talk to me yet again. At first, I tried to be nice about rejecting him, but by the third or fourth time, I just grew sick of it. I told him that if he kept it up, I was going to tell my parents and they would go to the police. He finally left me alone for a long time after that. This entire experience really taught me to trust my gut because he was literally trying to date a 14-year-old girl. I really hope that this tells you that no matter what, it's always okay to listen to your gut. Otherwise, you could end up in a very scary or really uncomfortable scenario. When I was about five years old, my school was doing the stranger danger talk with all of the students. Things like, don't talk to strangers, if a car follows you, walk further back on the sidewalk and then walk the opposite way where the car is facing and how to get someone's turn signal to go off if you're in their trunk. Things like that. After school, I usually went to after school care. That is, unless my mom was going to be working late. In that case, then my grandparents would pick me up. This happened pretty often since my mom was a single badass mom of three who worked full time as a charge nurse and was also battling cancer. I never really minded going to my grandparents' house so much, especially since they really spoiled me rotten. I had one of those Razor scooters that I would always ride up and down their driveway, as well as my uncle's because he lived next door. One day while I was playing in the backyard, I then heard the sound of my grandpa's truck leaving the driveway. I got really excited because I knew that I could now ride my scooter in the driveway. Normally I would go inside and tell my grandma because she would keep the front door open to keep an eye out on me. But I didn't want to waste any time since I didn't know when my grandpa would be back. I had quickly ran out of the gate right to the front yard, grabbed my scooter, and then started riding back and forth between my grandparents and uncle's driveway. A few minutes later, I had noticed a man at the end of the block. He had slowly started walking towards the house. The only reason he caught my attention as odd is because it was September in Texas, and it was really hot. I was wearing capris and a short sleeve shirt, while the man had long pants and also a jacket on with the hood up. His hands were in his pockets, and his head was down. Thinking back to what we had been talking about at school, I had started to get really nervous, but made another round to both driveways. The man had started walking faster now. I tried to justify it by thinking that maybe he'd been friends with my uncle or something. I mean, that really could have been a possibility. This time, I had only went up and down my grandparents' driveway, not my uncle's. The man was at the end of my uncle's driveway and started cutting across the grass heading directly for me. I threw my scooter to the ground and ran for the backyard. 
Once I was in the backyard, I grabbed my dog and ran in the house. Because, I guess in my five-year-old mind, I was worried that my dog would get stolen by this man. Once I got inside, I had ran to my grandma, who was sitting on the couch. I asked her to go check if there was a man outside. She looked out the window and she said yes, that he's walking the other way. I didn't tell her what happened and feared that I would get in trouble for not telling her I was out in the front yard in the first place. I'm so glad that our school talked to us about strangers, because I honestly don't know if I would have reacted the same way without their talk. It took me a couple of months to be comfortable playing outside again, even in the backyard. When I did make an attempt to play out in the front, I decided to stay hidden in between my grandparents' and uncle's homes. One day while I was building a fort, I had noticed a car that was passing by my grandparents' house. It then slammed its brakes right in front of their house. I looked over and I noticed about two men right in the front of the car pointing at me. I took off for the backyard and then heard the car then pull out. I don't really know if they had bad intentions or not or maybe just wondering what I was doing. But that happening along with a creepy man was enough to terrify me into not playing outside for the next two years. For a five year old kid, I was terrified. My biggest mistake in high school was agreeing to take a AP physics class with the seniors. I was a rising sophomore at the time, so when I walked into a class with kids much older than I was, my teacher sat me next to the only other person there that was close to my age. He was a freshman and his name was Josh. Josh was one of those people who gave off weird vibes. He had a sloppily shaven head, empty eyes, and ate warm skittles in class. He was short, but mean looking, and the instant I sat down next to him, my teacher ordered us to exchange numbers and tried to make us start talking. For some reason, I really, really did not want to talk to him. I wasn't trying to be a a-hole, but he just scared me. Sitting next to him felt like what I can only describe as sitting next to a hungry dog while you're holding a piece of chicken. It felt like any second he would jump on me, even though he was a good six inches shorter than me. It really freaked me out that he had my phone number and name, even though I didn't know the kid. I had a feeling that him knowing literally anything about me was not good. Luckily, he didn't talk to me for over a week, and after some time, I thought I was just being overjudgmental, and he was just a socially awkward kid. One day, about three weeks later, after I started the class with him, he talked to me. He asked something like, You're the girl that drives the, uh, the F-150, right? And reluctantly, I said, Yeah. He then told me that cars were a hobby of his, and he had seen me driving and liked my truck. Although I was caught a bit off guard, he seemed innocent and nice, and we kind of became friends after that. He started texting me a lot after school, asking me a bit about myself and sharing a bit about himself too. Like I said, the kid seemed innocent, but I still couldn't shake the feeling that I shouldn't be telling him anything about myself, and I should not be talking to him. The average conversation continued for a month or so, until one day, when I came home from work, I work at a restaurant about 20 minutes away from my house. So, when I turned my phone on to drive to work, I honestly wouldn't have turn wouldn't turn it back on. I honestly wouldn't turn it back on until I drove back home. As phones were prohibited at the restaurant. One week I came home at 12 after doing closing shift, and he had sent me several odd texts. They all consisted of I love you and I want to take you to homecoming and be my girlfriend. They all rubbed me the wrong way. He didn't seem to really be asking as much as he was demanding me to have a relationship with him. That I wasn't comfortable with. I ultimately friend zoned him and told him I was going to bed. His response was, no, just no. It freaked me the F out and made me really not want to go to class on Monday. But I had no choice and I had to go. He didn't text me for the rest of the weekend. And when I sulked into class on Monday, he gave me the same hungry dog stare from day one, and I ignored him the whole class. I practically ran when the bell rang, and when I got to my car in the student parking lot, 
I saw him watch me drive away from the sidewalk. It freaked me out more than I'd like to admit, so I called one of my guy friends and asked him if I could drive him home from school so I'd feel safer until creepy Josh would be less creepy. He agreed and we made an arrangement there and then. A lot of people thought I was overacting, but I just knew in my gut that I needed someone in the car with me, and this guy friend seemed like the right one. When I came home from work at 10-ish Monday night, I opened my phone and saw more texts from Josh. This time they were much more predatory than the night before, as at night they were detailing how he would like me to perform sexual acts on him. I foolishly allowed this to happen for another couple of weeks. Still feeling uncomfortable in class when it finally hit a breaking point, Josh started sending me texts about how if I didn't love him, he had to die. At that point, I decided it was time to involve a dean, but she did virtually nothing. She basically explained that Josh was special needs, and to cut him some slack. Despite the predatory tone of the messages, she told me she would talk to him about it, but not to worry because he likely wouldn't do anything. I was infuriated and told my dad, who has his army of Italian brothers, who all decided to keep an eye on him. The creepy messages didn't get any worse and eventually they stopped after I blocked his number. That was when the really creepy stuff started. The cameras outside our houses kept picking up a person at night, someone very similar looking to Josh. This person kept knocking on the windows and looking into my car so my dad called the cops, who were actually awesome and kept a lookout on my house, for a while to deter the nightly visits. With the cop outside at night, the visit stopped, and my work started getting calls from Josh asking when I was working. My manager ended up alerting security who threatened him to stop calling. Then Josh decided to start frequenting the restaurant where I worked at every day and leave paper cranes on the table saying, I love you with my name, and my new boyfriend's name isn't good for you, I am. He started following me to class to my car to work, even though I pretended he wasn't there, and I was still driving my 6 foot 3 guy home friend with me. I refused to leave my house without a group of people, and debated skipping prom, and becoming a hermit, because he made me feel so unsafe anywhere. Eventually, my dad decided a restraining order would be a good idea, and I did get one granted, so he couldn't walk near me or contact me for five years. Thankfully, this finally caused the year-long nightmare to stop. I didn't see Josh again until my senior year, when I was walking down the hall with my friends. He saw me coming, stopped in his tracks, and slowly watched me walk past him with that same hungry dog look. That initially scared me the day I met him. You're probably wondering why he never got in any trouble when I contacted the dean and the police. Well, where I live, there's a bunch of laws that make it exponentially harder for someone with special needs to be punished for creepy behavior, even though they're just as capable to execute the behavior than the average person. The last time I saw Josh was on graduation when I could have sworn he was the one in the front row waiting for me to get my diploma. Although it's possible he was there for someone else, a part of me knows he was there for me. If there's one thing I've learned from all of this, it's that this can happen to anyone. I never thought this would happen to me until it did, and it robbed me of my safety, high school experience, and peace of mind. Always trust your instincts in someone. You are not required to be nice to anyone. Who makes you uncomfortable. That led me to now. I'm happy. I'm in a serious relationship with an awesome guy. And in a weird way, I'm glad. I was able to learn from this whole experience.